So the story didn't happen to me, but I heard it many times when I was growing up. My grandparents owned about 80 acres about 20 miles east of Snowflake, Arizona. They had moved to the land in the early 80s, after my grandfather had retired from the mine in San Manuel, Arizona. The land was pretty barren. I don't know why they chose to buy it. Red sandstone bluffs and dry washes cut across the landscape, dotted with juniper and cedar trees, and red sand everywhere. I suppose at that time the land was cheap. They didn't have close neighbors. The closest was about a mile away, which was actually my aunt and uncle. The next closest neighbor was a man named, well, let's call him Samuel. I never got his first name, just Samuel. He lived about four miles from my grandparents at the base of one of the sandstone bluffs. He was an asshole rancher, from what my grandparents said. He thought that he owned everything and was entitled to do whatever he wanted. More than once, my grandpa had caught Samuel cutting his barbed wire fence to let his own cattle into my grandpa's land to graze. Now this area is full of ancient Anasazi Pueblo ruins. Most of them have been destroyed by ranchers with backhoes trying to find pots to sell. I'm sure Samuel was one of them. So the story goes one day after losing a calf. Samuel stumbles upon a cave sealed by a giant slab of sandstone against one of the sides of the bluff. Curious about it, he used the backhoe to remove the boulder. After going inside, he discovers it to be one of those Anasazi burial caves. I'm sure he was pretty excited. He starts taking things from the burial cave and starts selling them. Well, from that moment on, he has some pretty shitty luck. First, he lost about half a million dollars in the stock market. Then, his cattle all get a disease and die. In financial ruin, he gets another blow. His wife gets diagnosed with a rare disease and dies. Then Samuel gets thrown from his horse and he gets paralyzed from his legs. This all happens within a couple of years. He tells everyone that he knows that he's become cursed from the Anasazi burial. They laugh it off. Samuel ends up putting everything that he still has and seals the cave back up with the boulder. He then abandons all his belongings and just leaves one night. This is all late in the 1980s by the way. Jumping a couple years ahead since Samuel abandoned his ranch house. The land and house are bought from a man from California. He puts the ranch house up for rent. My aunt is pregnant with her first son and decides to move from San Manuel to Snowflake to be closer to her parents. Now, Samuel's house is fully furnished. My aunt and her husband move in. He finds a job working nights at the local paper mill. It is very creepy out there at night. At first it seems like a nice little place. Creepy at night but not too bad. Then weird shit starts happening. My aunt starts hearing faint chanting and drums at night. She brushes it off. She had a hippie neighbor that lived about a mile away up on the bluff. So she figures it must be them doing hippie stuff. But she can't help but feel like someone or something is always watching her all the time. She then begins having nightmares every night, but chalks it up to being alone and, well, hormones. She finally tells my grandpa about it, and he loans her his dog to keep her company at night. She drives the dog out there and he refuses to get out the truck, the hair on his back straight up and growling. She gets freaked out but figures maybe he saw a rabbit or something and just brings him into the house. The dog just stares at the door and growls. And that same night, he just growls and barks all night. The drums and chanting are louder as well. The next morning, she finds human bare footprints around the house. So this goes on for about a week. The dog barks and growls every night. She has nightmares when she does sleep. Footprints in the morning. The chanting and drums keep getting louder. Finally, feeling like she's losing her mind. She then asked my grandma to come over and stay the night with her. Grandma is more than happy to. After finishing her chores, she heads over planning to make my aunt a nice meal. This is the late afternoon. My aunt then lays down for a nap, comfortable now that my grandma is there. 
My grandma decides to take a little walk at the base of the bluff. My grandma was a very religious person. She was very active in the church and devoted her life to Jesus. As she's out on her little walk, she likes to look for arrowheads. A little ways from the house, she gets a very unnerving feeling that something is watching her. She said it made her skin crawl. She could sense it was something evil. So my grandma begins to pray and walks back to the house pleading the blood of Christ. She decides not to say anything to my aunt who is awake because she is already scared. She then tells my aunt that maybe it's a better idea to stay in my grandma's house tonight. My aunt agrees. By the time my aunt gets her stuff together, the sun is about to go down behind the bluff. Grandma, my aunt, and the dog all load up in the pickup. Grandma turns the key, and nothing. She tries again, nothing. Not being very mechanically inclined, Grandma goes into the house to call Grandpa, but he doesn't answer. She remembers that he was going to go into town this afternoon. Dang it. They unload everything and go back into the house, waiting for Grandpa to get home. It's nighttime now. No moon. Pitch darkness. The dog then begins its growling. The sounds of chanting and drums begin, slightly faint at first, but then they start to get loud. My grandma then begins calling my grandpa again, and in between those phone calls, she also begins to pray. Remember, this is way before cell phones. They then hear something outside, some sort of howling, but it's not a coyote, something more ominous and terrifying. Something is moving just beyond the reach of the porch light. Both women are beyond terrified at this point. Finally. After turbo dialing grandpa, he finally answers. My grandma is pretty scared at this point and just says, Elvin, something is outside of the house. Get over here right now. For what seems like hours, they wait for grandpa's truck to come over the hill. Finally, they see the headlights. Before grandpa flies into the driveway, something runs across the road in front of him. His headlights illuminate an animal of some sort. Grandpa jumps out of the truck yelling for the women to get in. He unloads a couple of shots into the general vicinity of the animal. They haul ass down the dirt road towards Grandma's house. My aunt, against her better judgment, looks back. And that's when she sees red eyes watching them. The next day, my grandpa and uncle head over to the house. Grandpa verify that all around the house... There were bare footprints in the sand, along with some very large coyote tracks. Needless to say, my grandma and aunt never went back to that place again. My aunt won't even talk about it. I made the mistake of staying up too late and listening to the grown-ups talk. My aunt moved in with my grandparents, and my grandma swears that she would sometimes see those red eyes at night stalking the edge of her property. As far as I know, other people had tried living in Samuel's house, but they end up leaving within a month or two. That whole area is cursed. I always hated going out there. There's a strange evil feeling that I get, even at my grandparents. I have more stories about that cursed land that also involves other family members. But that's for another time. After researching and talking to my Native American friends, I'm pretty sure my family members had the misfortune of running into what they call a skinwalker. According to the Native Americans in the area, they like to visit graveyards, looting and desecrating the sites. They take pieces of the bodies, the bones, and other stuff, and they grind them into powder to use them in their curses. They're also known to terrorize people away from areas like burials and ruins. So I guess that explains quite a bit of all the stuff that happened around the house. I have talked to many Navajo people and they all say the same thing as well. They say to never go near or touch any sort of pottery because you can actually get cursed or sick and the only way to get rid of this is through a special ceremony. 
As for the skinwalker, he doesn't think it would be a, an Asasi curse. He said maybe it was a neighbor that was jealous of what they had and wanted it for their own. However, but they do use the bones as powder and they shoot bone needles into you that gets you sick. He also mentioned that this is why you need to be careful when you go to a thrift store and you end up buying a cursed object and it gets attached to you. Skinwalkers do the opposite from Navajo culture such as being near dead bodies, going to the ruins, and other taboo stuff. So yeah, it was possible that someone was messing with her, maybe out of jealousy, or simply to scare them off. My friends and I have this annual ritual. Every year, we get together and stay in a cabin up north. My friend Jake owns the cabin. Actually, it belongs to his father, but he lets us use it for a small fee. The cabin itself is incredibly nice both inside and out. Apart from having a mostly wooden exterior and it being isolated up in the mountains, one might actually mistake it for a vacation spot. It was that time of year and we all got together once again. Over the past years, it's just been me, Jay, and our two other friends, Chris and Mike. We started doing this yearly thing about five years ago when we all graduated from high school. We worried that we would lose touch with each other and that we wouldn't see each other anymore. So we all agreed to meet up once a year and spend a weekend together. The first year was a bit rocky. Mike couldn't make it because he was being extremely overworked without being able to get any time off. So it was just Jake, Chris, and I. We didn't do a lot. We mostly just watched movies, played some video games, and ate all the junk food we had brought with us. The following year was much better. On this time, we all got time off from work and met up on the mountain. We almost broke our necks because we were sledding while intoxicated. We still played video games for most of the weekend, but before we left, Mike had felt bad about the previous year so he brought a truckload of fireworks with them. We spent our last night there blowing up snow hills and filling the night sky with an incredible show of colors. The next year, we threw a large party up on the mountain. We had invited co-workers, old friends, and it was the first year I had brought Nikki with me. We had just started dating, and since we were inviting pretty much everyone we knew, I figure, well... What the hell, right? Everyone had a great time. Or so they told me. There was a lot of drinking. A lot of party games. And a broken wooden deer carving. That we had to pay Jake's dad back for it. But overall, it was a great time. Last year, we chose to limit the amount of people. We could only bring one additional person with us. Just to keep the alcohol intake and damages to a minimum. Jake, Mike and I all each brought our girlfriends. Chris, on the other hand, came alone. Anyways, as we spent that weekend watching old scary movies, playing board games, and taking hikes through the snowy wilderness, overall, it was a pretty good time. Last week, however, was anything but good. While Nikki and I were making our way up to the mountains, we had received a warning that a massive blizzard was heading our way. She gave me a nervous glance, but it had snowed up there lots of times before, and I told her not to worry about it. We had just arrived when the snowfall began to pick up. We grabbed our things and quickly dashed inside. We found Mike and Chris setting up a video game, and Jake in the kitchen putting away the food he had brought. I greeted them, then inquired to where their better halves were. They all said, almost in comical fashion, working. I laughed at the coincidence and took my jacket off. I asked Jake if he had seen the weather. He nodded, saying that we were going to get a few feet of snow, but nothing major. So we quickly settled in. After a few hours of watching Chris stomp Mike in Street Fighter, we all decided to watch some movies Jake had brought with him. His famous collection of scary movies, which I wasn't actually interested in. But of course, I was outvoted. While they put on the first movie, I stared out the window watching the endless snowfall outside. 
The sky was already darkened from the clouds overhead, but was now becoming much darker as the sun started going down. But something caught my attention through the flurry of snow. I wasn't sure, but I thought I saw someone standing out there. I blinked my eyes, and whatever it was wasn't there anymore. Thinking it was just the snow playing tricks on me, I rejoined everyone at the TV. About an hour into the film, Nikki had to use the bathroom, and a few moments later, we all jumped up to her screaming. Everyone else gave each other confused glances. As I ran to the bathroom, I found Nikki standing outside of the bathroom door. I asked what was wrong, and she just pointed to the window. She said that she saw something staring at her through the glass. Being the good boyfriend that I am, I puffed up my chest and walked over to the window. Looking closely through it, the only thing I could see was a thick layer of snow falling from the sky. By that point, our friends had joined us, and she told them what she saw. They all thought the movie had gotten to her, but I couldn't help but think about when I saw something standing outside as well. We decided to call it a night and each retired to our respective rooms. Throughout the night, Nikki just kept glancing out of the window. I told her to relax. If it was somebody, there were five of us and only one of them. This actually helped her calm down a bit. A couple of hours after we fell asleep, I was awoken to a tapping coming from the window. I cracked my eyes slightly open. On the other side of the glass was a face. It didn't look human. Its head was as white as the snow falling all around it, which contrasted the darkness outside. Its eyes were white and vacant, almost as if it were blind. A long, clawed hand tapped the pointed finger on the glass. It seemed like it was trying to get our attention. But the way it moved its head as it tapped made it seem like it had never touched glass before. After a few minutes of watching it, it slowly stepped backwards away from the window and faded from view. I immediately shook Nikki awake and told her what I saw. I could see the panic in her eyes slowly start to build as I described it. She told me that that was exactly what she had seen in the bathroom. We quickly got up and woke the others explaining what I saw. They were all skeptical. They all didn't really believe us, but I told them that we needed to leave now. While everyone else was packing their things, I walked over to the door and opened it. Even though what I saw on the other side had stopped me in my tracks, there was a pile of snow about halfway up the door. I looked over the mound of snow and saw that our trucks had been mostly been buried by the blizzard. I struggled to shut the door, but when I did, something happened that made us all stop what we were doing. There was a knock on the door. We all looked at each other, unsure of what to do. I locked the door quickly and told Chris to lock the back door. He nodded and ran off. We all stayed together in the living room, keeping our eyes fixed on the doors and windows. Nikki pulled out her cell phone. But with the bad weather and remote location, that was just wishful thinking. Mike started to shout in fear, and we all looked in the direction he was staring at. It was the window right next to the back door. That same, ghostly white face was on the other side. It tapped on the window, then began to pound on it. The glass then began fracturing all over. Thinking quickly, I led everyone upstairs to the master bedroom. We all poured inside and locked the door behind us. I could hear the glass break shortly after. We all held our breath as we waited. A few minutes later, the sound of something could be heard below us. Then, everything went quiet. We looked to one another, not sure if we should check to see if it was gone or not. And Jake stood up and walked over to the door. But just as he went to reach for the lock, a faint tapping was heard on the other side. We all sat there motionless, hoping that whatever it was would get bored and just leave us alone. A few hours passed as we waited, and not a sound was heard. I got up and walked over to the door. 
I pressed my ear to the wood and I could hear very soft breathing on the other side. I'm not sure why, but this out of everything scared me the most. That this fucking creature had been standing there, waiting for hours without making a single noise. Eventually, the sun began to rise, and the blizzard had finally died down. Chris, Jake, Mike, and I decided we would try to make a quick run to our trucks. We were going to force the door open and charge at whatever that thing was. Nikki, of course, advised against it, but we didn't have much of a choice. I counted to three and pulled the door open, but when I did, the creature was gone. We slowly crept downstairs and found all of our stuff was trashed. Our bags were torn open. The door to the fridge was practically torn from the hinges and all the food was thrown everywhere around the cabin. We spent the morning shoveling our trucks out enough to drive out of there and we all quickly left after that. We have no idea what that thing was or what it actually wanted, but we all decided to postpone next year's trip to the cabin. If it's snowing outside at night and you hear a tap on your window, get up and find somewhere safe. We were all very lucky, but if we hadn't been on the second floor with the door locked, I most likely wouldn't be writing this right now. I grew up in a small town just north of Anchorage, Alaska. My family had moved there only a few months after I was born. My father was a very outdoors man. He grew up very traditional. His father and grandfather took him hunting and fishing whenever they could. They would spend so much time outdoors. In fact, going into town felt almost alien to them. Or so my father liked to say. He grew up in Washington state, so he was already pretty much accustomed to the dense foliage that we live by today. Unlike his father or grandfather, who were both blue collar men, he went to college and got a degree in engineering. In a job interview, he was so flustered by his nerves he couldn't seem to answer the questions correctly. He said it was a miracle that he even got the job. Of course, my mother likes to remind him of how awkward his interview was, as she's the only one that had interviewed him. My mother worked as a hiring manager for an engineering company in Washington. After a few years, my parents had gotten married and a few more years after, I was well on the way. Their company was branching out to Alaska and were asking for volunteers if anybody would be willing to relocate. My father jumped at the opportunity, much to my mother's surprise. They both made a trip, and after getting settled a few months later, I was born. Throughout most of my younger days, my father would always seem to find time to take me camping and fishing. Once I had gotten a little bit older, he began to take me hunting as well. I didn't really enjoy the act of hunting, but my father was so excited about bonding that I didn't have the heart to tell him. Years flew by, and every summer, it would be me and him trekking over mountains and through dense brush. For my 16th birthday, he and I spent an entire week out in the forest. It might not be the greatest birthday present for some of you, but that's what my family life consisted of, so it wasn't too bad. Sometime after my 18th birthday, my father had an unfortunate accident at work. He had a piece of sheet metal fall on him and injure his back. He was laid up in a hospital for almost a month, but thankfully was in any danger. Once he was clear to come home, he spent the majority of his time on the couch. His birthday was coming up soon. She asked me if I would be willing to go hunt something as a gift for my dad. I thought about it for a bit. While well, I hadn't gone hunting by myself before, I had gotten my license and knew all the procedures involved. I have also gone hunting almost every year since I was old enough to. I agreed and told my mom I would try to bring something back, but not to get her hopes up. She thanked me, and after a week or so, 
I had gotten everything that I needed. I packed up my truck, grabbed my rifle, and headed out. I drove about an hour and a half to our usual spot to begin our hunting. I hopped out of my truck, grabbed my pack, slung my rifle over my shoulder, and began walking. Some of you might be surprised to find that the summer months can be pretty warm in Alaska. I have met visitors who were under the impression that Alaska was a winter wonderland all year round. And while that may be the case for some of the parts in Alaska, like further up north, it's not always true further south. It was a clear, sunny day overhead, and so I pushed my way through a thick brush. It seemed like a million mosquitoes wanted to take me down before I even got started. As I hiked further inward, keeping a close eye on my surroundings, I started to feel as if every animal was aware of my presence. My father was a better tracker than I was. I was mostly a few steps behind him, always staying quiet. During my journey, however, I caught a few indications of wildlife nearby, but they had long since fled upon my arrival. Eventually, the bright sun overhead grew dimmer and dimmer as I kept walking. I knew it would be far too dark to hunt soon, so instead, I began searching for a spot to set up camp. After hiking for a few more minutes, I came across a flat area. It seemed like a good place to set up for the night. I unhooked my tent from my pack and began setting it up. Being a one-person tent, it didn't take very long. While I still had a little bit of daylight left, I gathered up some twigs and branches that I could and built myself a small fire just outside of my tent. Not necessarily for keeping warm, but more to keep the insects away. Once I had a fire going, I started to relax, sitting just outside of my tent, taking in my surroundings more intently. There is this feeling that is present when you're in the wilderness by yourself, of peace and quiet. On the other hand, there is also an ever-present danger as well. I try not to think of the latter as I got ready to go to sleep. About three hours after I had fallen asleep, I was awoken by a noise nearby. It was the cracking of twigs and the rustling of grass. I cracked an eye open, trying to remain as still as possible. But it was hard to discern what had caused the noise in the first place. I listened close as my sluggish mind became sharper. The faint noise grew louder and louder as it approached my tent. The smell of my campfire filled the air around me. I wonder if it was a bear curiously wandering about. If that were the case, I didn't want to make any sudden movements. Either way, I waited for around 10 minutes listening intently for any more sounds but I didn't hear anything else. After a few more moments of silence, I began to get back into my sleeping bag and I was once again on the edge of falling asleep. But then, another broken twig forced my eyes open again. I was just about to get up and poke my head outside of the tent when I heard something else. A voice in the darkness. It sounded like a child, a small boy. And it simply said, Hello. Even though I wasn't moving, I felt my body tense up. Another step sounded outside of the tent, and the voice repeated once more. Hello? Hello? This time I noticed something very off-putting about the greeting. Apart from the fact that there might have been a child in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, in the middle of the night. The thing that was off-putting was that the hellos were perfectly identical. Almost like it was a recording of some kind. When I heard it, I grabbed my rifle, which was lying next to me, and I gripped it tightly. After another moment, I could hear faint breathing coming from the other side of my tent. The voice sounded a third time, and when it did, I immediately sat up in my tent, trying to make as little noise as possible, and I readied my rifle at the direction of the voice. I could feel sweat beginning to drip down and sting my eyes as I tried to remain calm. I tried to think of a response to this voice, and I could only manage to say, Who's there? As soon as those words left my mouth, 
Dark claws dug into my tent. The violent sound of tearing fabric filled the tent. Through the newly formed holes, I saw what was making that noise. And it definitely wasn't a child. Its skin was a darkened ash. And its eyes were a stark white. Its head was completely bald. But was covered in multiple pock marks and scratches. A jaw hung slack with slime dripping from it. Upon seeing this thing, my brain only repeated one single word over and over again. A word which I hadn't used in fear since I was a child. Monster. My shaking hand squeezed the trigger and a ring filled my ears. I couldn't hear anything, but I could see whatever it was stumble backward and collapse under the ground. As the ringing faded in and out, I could hear this thing coughing and wheezing violently. I scrambled to my feet and racked the bolt on my rifle as I forced my way out of what was left of my tent, ready to finish it off. But it was gone. I fearfully scanned the area, keeping my eyes peeled. There was no sign of the creature aside from a small pool of blood in the dirt nearby. I stepped back into my tent and gathered up everything as fast as I could. Before quickly making my way back towards my truck, the thought of me not making it out of the woods alive crossed my mind plenty of times as I jogged. Lucky for me, after only an hour of moving through the woods, the faint light of the sun began cresting on the horizon. It was enough to make my journey back a little bit easier. I found my truck and drove out of the woods like a bat out of hell and made it home soon after. When I got home, I told my mother that I had been unsuccessful in my hunting. She thanked me for trying regardless. My father chimed in from the couch, saying that it would have been different if he had been there. And that might have been true. Even though my father had been injured at his job, I take it as a blessing. A blessing that he won't be going hunting again for a very long time. As for me, well, I don't plan on ever going back into the Alaskan wilderness anytime soon. And if any of you out there are planning a trip, I would highly advise against it. There's something evil living out there in those woods. Something you don't ever want to see for yourself. My name is David Hernandez, and what I'm going to share with you is the most terrifying experience I have ever lived. This story happened a few years ago. At that time, I lived in a place called San Jose Paso Nuevo, very close to the Cofre de Perote, in a very small town with only a few houses, and it's very quiet. Unfortunately, in this place, I lived through a terrifying experience. One that has to do with an encounter with a Nahuatl. For several months, many people began to report that their animals were disappearing. There was no logical explanation because even animals disappear during the day. This was a very serious situation because as I mentioned, it's a fairly poor area. Losing an animal means losing a lot of money. People gather in the classroom with Don Agustin the oldest man in the town. They began to organize to deal with all this. Some people thought it was someone from a nearby community intending to take the animals, while others thought it was a coyote from the area. Fed up with the situation, people started to stand guard at night near the pens to catch the culprit. The first few nights, the men who stood guard swear that something made them fall deeply asleep. When they woke up, they realized that the two pigs were missing. Angry and upset, they began to count the lost animals in the village and realized that a total of 52 were missing. The most affected by the situation was a man by the name of Umberto. This man had lost about 35 animals from his property, which was near the town limits by the mountain. This led people to think that maybe it was some sort of predator from the Cofre de Perote attacking the poor animals. To confirm this theory, there was the testimony of Umberto's wife, 
The lady recounted that one night she went out because she heard the dogs barking. She walked around carefully and realized that a strange creature was on top of the perimeter fence. This was unlikely because the fence was almost three meters high. But this animal was on top and seemed to be some sort of dog. When the lady approached it, the animal jumped and ran off into the darkness. The lady told the story to the people of the town and her husband offered a large sum of money to whoever kills this beast. My family was always short of money, so I was one of those who volunteered to stand guard on his property. That night, at around 1.30 in the morning, we were watching the goat pen because it seemed that those animals were more like. The pen was made out of stone with adobe, and we were just behind it. Soon, some of our companions fell asleep, and we didn't know how it happened. We were talking and out of nowhere, they just fell asleep. Those of us who were awake began to hear a strange noise, and we decided to prepare the weapons because we had confirmed that it was just a coyote. Maybe this was the reason why everyone else fell asleep because in my town, it is said that these animals have some kind of witchcraft power. We were getting ready to face one or maybe several coyotes, but we were not ready to face whatever it was that appeared before us. We heard heavy footsteps and they were gradually getting closer. It was near and that's when we saw it. A huge creature, gray in color. It was crouching just in front of the pen. I can't explain it. This animal was maybe about a meter and a half tall in that position. And just when we thought that its size was incredible, we were in for another big surprise. The thing stood up and its eyes were completely white. It had only one ear and a very slack jaw. Its fangs were visible, even more so with that ugly mouth. And it looked extremely thin with fairly short fur and claws about 10 or 15 centimeters long. We didn't know what to do and we had heard stories of Nahuales from our grandparents. But it had been years since such a creature had manifested in this area. I couldn't believe a single finger. I was paralyzed with fear, just like everybody else. It stared at us for about five minutes. And I swear, those minutes felt like hours. Suddenly, after being completely still, the creature began to move its head up and down. In a matter of seconds, it leaped into the pen and that made us react so we got ready to shoot it. But all of our guns jammed. This creature lifted two goats and ran off. We reacted a few seconds later and started the pursuit. We were guided by the sound emitted by the goats and the creature was headed towards the Cofre de Perrote. Some of us ran while others went on horseback. Obviously the latter group got there first. They arrived where the trail disappeared and we arrived about 30 minutes later. Those who were already there told us that the strange creature had entered a cave about 10 meters away. I don't think anyone in the town knew of its location because if it weren't for this situation, we would have never found the cave. We were guarding the entrance, but nothing happened. Hours passed and it was dawn when those who had gone on horseback returned for Mr. Umberto. They told him what happened the previous night and the priest of the town came down to the cave around 8 in the morning. He was told about the events of the previous night, and the priest blessed the place. As soon as he started blessing the place, we began to hear a man crying. The priest told us not to be tricked by it. It was a trick from the Nagual. When the priest finished praying, that's when the loud screams joined by curses were heard. We ended up deciding to seal the entrance with rocks and play several protections that the town's priest gave us. We stood guard there for two more nights just to make sure that it didn't come out. And during that time, we heard the same howling several times. It seemed like an animal was trapped in the cave, and all we could hear was its desperate attempts to escape. A few days had passed, and a lady with a baby in her arms came looking for her husband. She was from a nearby town called Tonalco, and she said her husband hadn't come home for several days. The last time he left, he said he was going to San Jose Paso Nuevo to buy some animals. We didn't know what to tell her, 
We asked what her husband did, and she replied that he bought and sold animals. She confessed that their financial situation had improved only a few months ago because they were very poor. But since her husband started this business with a friend, things had been better for them. There was no doubt in anybody's mind that this man was the same Nagual that had been stealing the animals. We told the lady that we didn't know anything about her husband. Sadly, she returned to her town. And from that day on, weird things started happening in the town. During the night times, people would hear weird noises in the middle of the night in the streets. They said they would see strange black birds perched on the roofs of the houses and a horrible smell of rotting flesh in the early hours. To make matters worse, many people returning from work late at night would claim to see a man dressed in black walking towards that cave. The priest said that the man was the same one who came to visit his son after having experienced all this. I eventually decided to move, for I became very afraid. And every night, I dreamed of that creature that I saw. I ended up asking for help from a relative who lives in Poza Rica, and he kindly let me live with him. From here, I share my story with you, and I swear, it's not a joke. If you visit the town of San Jose Paso Nuevo, you can hear the same exact story from the mouth of many people. Living alone in the woods can be scary to a lot of people. I'm sure there are many who find it difficult to be removed from technology and placed into isolation. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with technology or enjoying it. Far from it, actually. It's made life so much easier, and that can be often a good thing. All I'm trying to say is living in the mountains or wilderness isn't the easiest of lives to live. But it can be very rewarding and enjoyable for the right person. Hell, when I was younger, I was always excited to see new technology being developed. Smartphones and video games. I always had to have the newest thing. That was my life growing up, all the way up to high school. And then, after getting a dead-end job punching in numbers on a keyboard, I decided it was time for a change. My friends and family told me I was insane for going through with this. Some even remarked that I wouldn't last very long and would come crawling back to civilization. They all acted like I was just going to wander into the woods and live in a tree or something. Quite the opposite. I had found a cabin for sale up north. Even though it was quite basic, it was exactly what I was looking for. Something I could make my own and not have to worry about other people getting in the way. Even though I was planning on living far out in the woods, I wasn't going to be totally cut off from society. There was a very small town not too far away from my cabin. It had a single gas station and a few shops here and there. Those shops are actually where I earned most of my money. Now I do some odd jobs for them. And the pay is more than enough for me to get by. The rest of my needs I get from nature itself. I use a wood burning stove for heat and cooking. I have a small generator which provides some power to the lights in the fridge in the cabin. But that's about it. Half the time, I don't even use my lights. Instead, I just use oil lanterns. For water, I would have to haul it from a stream in the woods or collect grain and then boil it. For food, I have to go hunting or purchase what I need from one of the shops in town. The first week living there was a major shock to my system, going from being a cubicle monkey to immediately roughing it in the woods. You realize pretty quickly just how different things are. Lucky for me, my support system wasn't all negative. My father, who was an outdoors man for a good portion of his life, gave me a lot of tips and advice regarding this matter. He had been very supportive. Even if it stemmed from a cliché point of view, he would often visit me once a month just to enjoy the more simple life, as he liked to put it. By the end of the first year living there, I felt like I had come into my own. I had figured out what I needed to do 
to live comfortable. Don't get me wrong, I also had many mistakes along the way. I almost burned down the entire cabin twice and nearly had a tree fall on me. Overall though, I was very happy with my choice to move out here. That was until a few days ago. The day began and ended as if it were just another day of the week. I had gotten up and started a fire in my stove to provide some much needed heat. I ate breakfast and spent the morning chopping wood and gathering water. After that, I drove into town and helped out Jim at the store for a bit before heading back home. As I drove along the trail back to my cabin, the sun had set, which made driving a little bit more difficult. I kept a close eye on the road in front of me, and after a few minutes, I finally arrived. I unloaded some supplies I had picked up and spent the evening making dinner. I had gone to bed at roughly around 10 p.m. About an hour or so later, I was startled awake by a noise echoing throughout my cabin. Someone had knocked on my door. I sat up in bed, wondering if I had simply dreamed the noise. I waited in the pitch dark of my bedroom, listening. Then, it sounded again. The knock sounded throughout my darkened cabin. I got out of bed and quickly put on some clothes. After I got dressed, I knelt down next to my bed and retrieved my shotgun. This might actually sound strange to you, but in my entire year of living out in the woods, I never had a visitor aside from people whom I knew were coming. I especially never had someone knock on my door this late at night. The odds were that it was just some camper or something who had simply gotten lost and was looking for help. As I approached my door, I couldn't help but feel some nervousness growing in the back of my mind. I was only a few feet away from my door and I could already tell something was strange. You would think that someone who is needing help would be saying something. I began to think that whoever it was must have thought that nobody was home and moved on. I took a few more steps towards my door and waited. I was just about to turn around and head back to bed when three more knocks sounded against my door. When I heard this, I took a step back. My internal alarms were echoing in my head. I didn't know who it could be. I knew that any normal person wouldn't just be silently standing outside in the cold and knocking at random intervals. I clutched my shotgun in my hand and I walked over to the only window overlooking my front yard area. I tried my best to crane my neck to see towards the front door. Even though it was dark outside, the clear moonlight sky provided just enough light for me to see. There was nothing standing in front of my door. I scanned around the area to see if there were any signs of anybody walking around and there were none. I rubbed my tired eyes and began walking back to bed. About halfway to my bedroom, three more knocks echoed. This time, they were much harder than before, as if whoever was on the other side was beginning to strike the door with force. Hearing this made me spin on my heels with my shotgun at the ready. Another three knocks. I could feel my hands starting to tremble as I stared with wide eyes. I wasn't sure who was outside my door, and I wasn't sure what to do. The next impact, forcefully, struck my door open. I stared in disbelief. It was tall, taller than my door frame. It raised a skinny hand with bony fingers and gripped the inside of the door. Kneeling down, it lowered its head to my level. The first thing I noticed were the eyes. They were big like those aliens that you see everywhere. Its cheeks taper its face to a pointed chin. It didn't seem to have a mouth. Well, as far as I could tell, it was now crouching in my door frame and trying to come inside the cabin. I could feel my hands beginning to stiffen up. They gripped the shotgun tighter and tighter until it went off. The sudden noise sent a ringing in my ears. A brief flash of light filled the room followed closely by the smoke from the blast. When the smoke cleared, that thing that had been standing in my doorway was nowhere to be seen. What I could see, however, was my truck sitting a few yards away. I stepped towards my door. I peeked my head out and looked around. 
There was no sign of whatever that thing was. Seeing the opportunity before me, I darted across the uneven ground and jumped into my truck. I started the truck up and when the headlights came on, I could see it. It was standing on the roof of my cabin. It looked like some eerie statue at first. I quickly put my truck in reverse and turned around. I pulled onto the trail and floored the gas pedal. My truck started to bounce and rattle as I drove. Eventually, I came onto the main road, nearly crashing in the process. I drove towards the gas station, which thankfully stays open late. I dashed inside and demanded to use the phone. A teenager by the name of Jason, whom I met a few months before, gave me a look of panic confusion. He handed me the phone, and I quickly dialed 911. It took the police nearly an hour to reach me. After spending another 30 minutes explaining to them that someone had tried to break into my cabin, we finally went there to investigate. I left my truck nearby as the officers examined the surrounding area with flashlights. After a few moments, they told me there was no sign of anyone, or anything, in my cabin or nearby. They told me they would file a report, and to call them if anything happens. I said thank you, and they left. Once they did, I ran inside, grabbed a few of my essentials and headed out myself. I stayed the night at my parents' house about an hour away. They were both equally surprised to find me sleeping on their couch when they got up. I explained to them that somebody had tried to break into my cabin, and they both shared looks of concern. The next day, I went back to the cabin to look around more closely. I didn't find much out of place, just the door and some holes in the wood for my shotgun. I always thought that living the simple life would be much more enjoyable than the life in the city, but as I stared at the massive, elongated footprints pressed into the mud that led off into the woods. I'm starting to think that working at an office isn't so bad after all. Before I start, I'll provide some background. This story takes place in the early 2000s, about 18 years ago when I was still attending UND in Grand Forks, Minnesota on my last fall semester. A group of my classmates and I were assigned a group project for our final. The final was to create a small movie and each group was assigned a different genre. While some groups got comedy, romantic, and anime, we found ourselves with having to create a horror film. The members of our group were me, Ace, Altina, and Brooklyn. You know how back then when professors used to make random strangers and have them work together? Well, that's exactly what happened. The four of us were grouped together and given this project at the beginning of the semester, with a deadline set for the end of the semester. As we spent the semester sitting together and getting to know one another, we became really close friends, you can say. Even though it was hard to talk with Ace at first, always very quiet, sometimes a bit awkward, but once we were able to get past this, we got the ball rolling. It was almost like a joke on the professor. Despite being a group of random individuals with different backgrounds, we knew we were going to be able to pull this off. We brainstormed ideas for the film, talked about places where to shoot it, and planned for us to get the highest grade possible. Now, I said we all had different backgrounds because, well, Ace was native. Well, he is native, and I say this because he came up with the idea that had us all excited. He mentioned that he had always known of some spots at the Red Lake Reservation in Minnesota, especially in the forested areas in the Red Lake State Forest. He said these places were known for creepy legends, stories, and supposed reports of strange sightings, which made it perfect for our final. He said that maybe we should take a step further by actually going out to these locations, filming there, and maybe even camping there, all while recording our experiences in found footage style. Of course, this all grabbed our attention, so we all agreed that we would go camping and actually grab some real footage of these locations. So we ended up making plans to go, 
and we quickly organized everything, trying to do this as soon as possible, even though the project wasn't due until the end of the semester. Okay, so let me stop here and correct myself. It's not that Ace was awkward, it's just that remember, he might have cultural differences and maybe that's why he spoke the way that he spoke and even say certain things. He is part of the Chippewa tribe and maybe it's not that he is awkward, he might just have different ways of interacting with people. Anyways, he began to open up to us about his rich native culture as we worked throughout the semester and brainstormed together. He talked to us about his family leaving the Red Lake Reservation for unknown reasons that he never mentioned. And well, he never looked back and ended up going to a public school and eventually got accepted to UND Grand Forks. Speaking of Minnesota, it was quite a journey for me personally. You see, I'm originally from Texas, but I ended up here when my parents separated a few years back. It was actually a big change. On the other hand, Tina and Brooke had been here their whole lives. So they were our local experts when it came to learning all there is about Minnesota. And Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, has a rich cultural landscape, including tribal lands that hold a significant place in its history. Among these tribal lands, a majority are by the Chippewa tribe, also known as the Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people. One of the most tribal lands within the state is the Red Lake Reservation. This res stands out not only for its natural beauty, but also for it being strict prohibited against outsiders. The day had finally arrived, and we all agreed to embark on my truck. The same truck that actually faithfully followed me all the way from Texas. I began the trip by picking up Tina and Brooke. However, Ace simply said to pick him up on the street across from his house. He said it was because he didn't want his family suspecting of how close we were going to the Red Lake grass. So when we all got there, it was actually kind of funny. He looked like a hitchhiker with a single bag in hand. With Ace on board, we hit the road with Ace guiding us and telling us which way to go. As I was driving, I couldn't help but be curious about Ace and his connection to the res. So I leaned over and asked, Ace, so what's the deal about this Red Lake res? Why don't they allow outsiders? Ace remained fixed on the road ahead, and with a serious expression, he said, It's very rich in history as my family's told me, and there's a lot of native land around these parts. The Red Lake Res is one of the oldest and most isolated reservations in Minnesota. It's actually been closed off to outsiders for a long time. And also, there are stories, legends even, about things that happen in the Res, even in the woods, around the Res itself. Brooke, sitting in the passenger seat behind us, turned to Ace and said, Hey Ace, what kind of things are we talking about here? I mean, are they just scary campfire stories, or is there something more to them? I quickly interrupted and said, Hey, get this on video. I can already see it. The beginning of the film. Four buddies traveling through an isolated road to go camping. Tina quickly grabbed the camcorder and just started recording as we spoke. Ace then told Brooke, some are just stories, you know, just to scare kids at night and to have them behave good. But there's more. Well, actually, let me just say that there have been reports of strange sightings, unexplained sounds, and even strange things in these woods. My family always told me these stories, that people out in the woods would see things that they can't explain. Tina, who had been quietly listening from the backseat recording, interrupted by saying, you mean like flesh pedestrians? Do you have any personal stories or experiences about them? I could hear Brooke wanting to laugh. It's flesh pedestrians, dummy. And they both started laughing. What the hell is a flesh pedestrian? I said. Brooke stopped laughing and said, Oh, she actually means like skinwalkers. The supposed witches that shapeshift and hunt you down. But that's actually down there in Arizona, in the Navajo res. But everyone calls them by names. Some people even call them foreskin walkers. As soon as she said that, we all started laughing except Ace. And Ace in a serious tone said, 
there are some things that shouldn't be joked about, as I was told growing up. But let's just say that sometimes these woods have a way of making you question what's real and what's not. Tina then said, Alrighty then, sorry Chief Ace. We continue laughing as we continue our driving towards Red Lake State Forest. And after driving for about 30 minutes into the area, we came across a sign indicating a camping site with an arrow pointing to the left. However, Ace said that we should continue straight ahead. He mentioned knowing some less populated spots a few more miles down the road. And to be honest, that's exactly what we were hoping for. In order to create a distraction-free and scary setting for our movie. After about 30 minutes, A said to slow down and pull into a small open space coming up ahead. He told us he was very familiar with the area as the res is right next to the forest. And him and his friends as kids used to sneak away from the res for days. As we parked, I turned the ignition off and said, Well, is everyone ready? Brooke, looking at the surroundings, Ask if this was an actual camping site. I looked at Ace. However, he quickly said that this was not our intended destination. He said that there should be clearings up ahead, about five minutes further into the area, that should be suitable for camping and filming. Of course, those five minutes felt like 15 minutes. When we finally arrived at a clearing, Brooke, looking around, said, Uh, are we sure we can actually camp out here? This place looks a bit abandoned, doesn't it? It does seem a bit eerie. I mean, what do you expect from an isolated camping ground? Said Tina. Well, that's true, Brooke agreed. But let's just make sure we stay together. This place kind of gives me the creeps. I asked Ace to tell us more about the reservation. And he said, Well, growing up, not many outsiders know about these woods. It's said to be one of the oldest parts of the res, even though we're not in the res itself. A lot of native people say that these woods belong to them. That's why it's untouched by modern development. But it also has a bunch of stories. Strange occurrences. Stories of spirits and unexplained things. Some of the elders in the res always warned us of wandering away too far into the woods. Because apparently witches lived out here. Witches? I said. Brooke then interrupted and said, He means skinwalkers. They just don't use that word because of their beliefs. Isn't that right, Ace? Ace then nodded and said, You are correct. My people always said that simply by thinking of them, saying their name. There are forces out there who are listening to see who calls on them. Tina then told Ace, But isn't that what you're doing right now? Ace then responded and said that they always go get blessings by his elders when they come to visit. So he is basically non-existent to these things. We all started unpacking, which included food, tents, camping gear, and of course, some liquor. After everything was set up with the surrounding area, we decided to explore around the woods a bit for our project. The concept of our film was to create a cliche found footage style film similar to the Blair Witch Project, with Ace and me playing the lead characters. Tina and Brooke took charge of operating the camera and the tripods and making appearances here and there. Now that I look back, I can't deny it was a bit cheesy, but it turned out to be a lot of fun. After what seemed like a few hours of shooting, Ace suggested that we head back to campsite as it was gonna get dark pretty soon and we didn't wanna get lost. He said it gets dark quote unquote sooner out here in the deep woods because the trees cover the sun a lot more. Now this is when shit first started and maybe at this point we should have just left. But we didn't. I guess cause we didn't see it like such a big deal. When we got back to our campsite we noticed that some of our stuff had been moved around and some of our supplies had disappeared. It left us feeling uneasy about the situation. But Ace helped us calm down by suggesting that it was most likely a deer or some birds. So we brushed it off and we started a campfire. And we all sat around talking to each other about plans after graduation. As the night progressed and we started talking more, I reached into my pocket. Hoping that my weed wasn't missing that I had brought with me. With a smirk, I pulled it out 
and held it up for everyone to see. See? Never leave your stash behind. Even though some sort of animal had gone through our stuff, I'm glad the weed was still with me. This right here is the cure for all things. It'll make this camping experience even more unforgettable. So let me just say that there are a few things I always carry in my pocket. My stash, my keys, my wallet. And well back then cell phones weren't as common as they are now. So I didn't carry a cell phone with me the way I do now. Ace responded, man I'm in. Let's see what you got here. There better not be no cheap sticks and twigs. I looked at Tina and Brooke. Ladies, what about y'all? They exchanged glances, then shook their heads in unison. Nah, we're good, Tina replied. We'll leave the adventure to you two. With a chuckle, Ace and I wrote some papers. As soon as we got to talking and laughing, I told Ace. Yeah, this isn't anything like that Chippewa smoking stuff, huh? He just started laughing as Brooke and Tina just started talking between themselves. After a few more minutes of joking and laughing and making fun of Tina's crocs, a foul smell resembling a mix of rotten milk and vomit came with such an intensity that was almost unbearable. Brooke couldn't help but say, which one of you farted? It smells like burnt shit. We all started laughing, attributing the smell to the effects of being both stoned and drunk. However, the laughing quickly died down when we all heard a rustling in the bushes behind our tents. Panic set in as Ace grabbed the knife, stood up, and carefully walked over and scanned the tree line, ready for whatever might be out there. As we sat there in our somewhat different states of either drunk or being high, Tina, in her drunkenness, said, Way to go, Chief Ace. We all started laughing as she attempted to lighten the mood. But Ace didn't say anything, and the humor quickly faded as we continued to listen to the rustling in the bushes, unsure what was out there moving, and with Ace just standing there. After what felt like five minutes, maybe because of how high I was, Ace came back and leaned in. You know, he began, sometimes a dead animal nearby can bring foul smells like that. Maybe it's just some wildlife scavenging nearby. Well, shit. Literally. Shit. What kind of animal out there is playing a prank on us by shitting near us? We all started laughing and after a few more hours, we decided to call it a night and crawled into our tents. Throughout the night, I woke up to the sound of crunching of leaves around me, like if somebody was walking around the tent, and the steps got closer to my tent, and that's when I heard Ace. I can see you. Even in the dark. I'm not sure why but those words creeped me out. So I told him to shut the fuck up. And to stop trying to scare me. And to go back to sleep. He simply walked away to the right side of my tent. Which is where his was at. The next morning. We woke up with slight hangovers and feeling dehydrated. It was cloudy. Unlike the sunny day before. I crawled out of my tent. And Ace was sitting in the camp chair at the edge of the fire, poking the ashes with a stick. Lost in thought, I walked over to him. Ace, you almost had me last night, dude. I'm not gonna lie, you kinda freaked me out a little bit. But he just stayed quiet, and when I approached him to ask him if he was alright, he looked up and said he was fine. He asked if I wanted to go exploring into the woods, and I asked why. Yeah, he's weird. I thought in my head. He simply replied by saying just curious. And even though I found it weird, I agreed. We decided not to wake Tina and Brooke since they both admitted they are both cranky when disturbed from their sleep. Of course, we gotta start the morning right. We rolled some joints and disappeared into the woods. High as fuck. Exploring nature was fun. Joking and laughing along the way. Even though Ace was on the quiet side and a bit awkward sometimes, him being drunk or high was like being a normal person. We reached the top of a hill, sat down, and chilled for a bit. Overlooking part of the woods, I took some pictures with my quick snap camera because the scenery was beautiful. Ace didn't ask me if I heard the screeches and sounds last night. I hadn't, but he described them as being pretty loud. 
I brushed it off as maybe a fox or something. But something did catch my eye. He seemed creeped out. And I'm not sure if it was his awkwardness, him feeling the effects of the weed or something. But it was strange to see him like this. When I asked him if that's why he was so quiet in the morning, he confirmed it and said he felt strange about it. Man, fuck that. Are you joking or are you being serious? I said. All this crazy shit that's been going on has me on edge. We started walking back to the campsite and after about 15 minutes of walking, I kid you not, we came across a different smell. The smell of decomposing flesh. There goes that shitty smell again, I said. As we kept walking, we came across a dead bird, completely skinned and mutilated. I looked down at it wondering who or what could have done this. I then recorded the dead bird and because I mean, the more raw, the better, right? Look at this shit, man. What do you think? As Ace got closer and as I was recording and talking in the background, I kid you not, we heard rustling from deeper into the trees beside us. And that's when we both looked at each other and fucking ran back to the campsite, terrified. As we arrived at the campground, I told Tina and Brooke what happened. And to my surprise, they believed me. Maybe because of all the weird stuff going on. So we sat on the chairs talking about the weird shit that's been happening. I showed them the recording of the dead bird we came across, hoping that the sound we heard could be heard in the background, but there was nothing. Again, we didn't have iPhones or good cameras at our fingertips. We had what you call camcorders, blurry and not so high def tech like you all have now. Ace also told him that he heard some noises last night and I could tell everyone was worried, but they didn't want to show it. Now that I remember all this, it felt like one of those situations where we all knew some weird shit was going on, but nobody wanted to admit it. So we decided to leave first thing tomorrow morning. So we ended up filming for another two hours, but then we called it an early day because A said he wasn't feeling too good. We also didn't really explore anymore and just stayed around the campsite. Except this time as we gathered around the campfire at night, Tina had her camcorder on trying to get as many moments as possible. She was recording as we were talking to each other. Almost like an interview style of her asking me about the bird that I had found earlier and asking Ace about the voices he heard at night. As it started to get darker, all four of us started to get scared. We actually talked about leaving at that moment. But Ace said it was too dark to get back to the truck. And so we ended up just deciding to stick together. We even talked about sleeping in the same tent. But that was impossible as they were not big enough. So with the light of the campfire, we just got the tents closer to each other. Helping us feel a little bit more safe as we agree to leave as soon as the sun comes out. Later that evening, as I was inside my tent, I heard the sound of footsteps beside my tent. Ace called out in a voice that sent chills down my spine. He said, Are you scared of it? I turned my head towards where the voice was coming from, and it was coming from my right side where Ace's tent was at. I thought maybe he was trying to pull a prank on us, so I simply said, why are you talking like that, dude? And he said, I can see you, even in the dark. We've been here long before you arrived. What the fuck are you talking about, man? I said, but he didn't answer. And I could tell he was just standing there. And without saying anything, he turned back to his tent but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was deeply wrong. Not once did I hear his tent sip open and close. So even though I was scared as fuck, I decided to step out of the tent to see what Ace was doing. As I came out, everything was pitch black. The fire had died down as my eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness. I took about two or three steps towards Ace's tent when suddenly, I felt a cold hand clamp down on my shoulder. 
sending shivers down my spine. My heart started pounding in my chest as I turned around expecting to see someone standing behind me. But there was nobody. Just empty darkness. Creeped the fuck out. I hurried towards Ace's tent. My eyes starting to see more in the dark. I reached out to shake the fabric of his tent, urging him to come out. Get out, Ace. My voice with urgency. As at this point, I was desperately freaking out. Ace, Brooke, Tina, get up. A few seconds passed and they started stumbling out of their tents. I wasted no time in telling them, we need to get the fuck out of here now. There's something out here. We have to leave. Tina and Brooke were just standing there looking at me confused, with Ace asking me what's going on. There's somebody out here, man. They were walking around our tents a few minutes ago, saying some things. That's when Brooke asked me if I was drinking. I almost flipped out. But then, a silence fell over the forest. No crickets chirped. There was no wind blowing through the trees. It was as if nature itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. And this caught everybody's attention. Complete silence. That's when Ace said, let's go right now. And Ace just started walking towards the tree line. It might be too dark, but I'm pretty sure it's straight this way. At this point, we just started speed walking and we left every single thing behind. The cameras, the tripods, our belongings, the tents, the chairs, everything. And then, the forest came back alive with a bunch of different sounds. And at that point, we started running. I could hear Tina and Brooke starting to cry. I know we weren't that far away from the truck. But God, it felt forever. And then... The scariest thing in my life. We started hearing sounds of footsteps. Not human, but something else. The sound of a bunch of different footsteps running alongside all of us. Like the sound of dogs racing beside us. I then told Tina and Brooke to keep their eyes closed and keep running straight ahead. And that's when I felt it. Something behind us. I could hear somebody or something running directly behind me like the sound of dogs or horses galloping behind us close enough that it was literally sending shivers down my spine like imagine somebody running directly behind you breathing down your neck in the middle of the night every step felt like an eternity i was for sure that at any moment i was going to be overtaken by whatever was behind me but finally we reached the truck, and without hesitation, we all got in and sped off. And as I looked in the rearview mirror, I could see plenty of yellow eyes gleaming in the darkness, watching us as we sped away. As we left the forest, a heavy silence filled the air. The only sound that was going on was the truck's engine. We didn't even say anything to each other. As Tina and Brooke were crying. Fuck. I was crying myself. As we neared the town. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that still lingered in the back of my head. Turning to Ace. Who was sitting beside me. I said. What the fuck happened back there? Ace. Seemed to be lost in thought. After a few. After about a minute. He spoke. And the only thing he said was, we need to get a cleansing from a medicine man. They have took notice. His words sent a chill down my spine. Nothing else happened after that. Maybe in another post, I'll go more into detail about what the medicine man told us. But I'll end it with this. I know what I saw years ago in the Red Lake Forest. Stay away from the tribal grounds of the Red Lake Res. There's some creepy shit going on around the woods of that res. Don't go near it. There's a reason why it's closed off. And that's why only they limit who can visit or live in the res. If you stay in Minnesota, 
Don't ever venture out into the woods. I know these things are still out there. So I have a story to tell and I'm not sure if you all will believe me but I have learned to not talk about skinwalkers which in my defense I'm not exactly talking about them I'm just giving you all the warning so I'll get straight to the point me and a group of friends decided to go camping at the Kaibab National Forest in Arizona we were gathered around the campfire talking about various topics and of course being right next to the Navajo Nation, the subject of skinwalkers and other things regarding the Navajo people was brought up. Questions as to why they're so secretive about these things. I know you all heard the tales and the stories about not sharing anything about them and how they don't like to talk about skinwalker stuff with people outside the res. Anyways, we were surrounded by a dense forest. And looking at the stars above us, everything was so beautiful. As we started drinking and smoking, and the night deepened, my friend Cliff excused himself to step into the woods to go take a leak. And well, I know most guys know, but if you're a lady reading this, it doesn't take long to use the bathroom for us men. So anyways, a few minutes turned into 5, and then 10, and then 15. And it wasn't like him to be gone for so long. I mean, I know alcohol makes you go to the bathroom a lot. And we're not ready into pulling pranks into each other. So armed with a flashlight, I venture into the trees. The same direction that I saw Cliff go. As I was walking, I was also calling for him. I walked for about two or three minutes into the trees. And there was nothing. There was only silence. There were no noises from anything. No insects. Nothing. Then, I heard it. His voice. I knew it was him. I followed the sound and I started shouting for him. I thought he might have been hurt or something. So I kept calling out to him. And I kept hearing his voice. Over here. Finally, I stumbled into a clearing. Where I saw Cliff standing still. Just looking up at the stars above him. Hey. Check, Check this, this out, out, man. Cliff mentioned, motioning and pointing to the sky. What the hell are you doing, Cliff? I approached, with my flashlight aimed at his back. As I was coming out the tree line to him, that's when I felt something on my shoulder from behind. I jumped, and that's when I saw. Cliff. Confusion set in. I shined my flashlight to the other person who I thought was Cliff. But when I looked at him, he was facing us. It was undeniably humanoid, but horribly wrong. Its eyes, unblinking, it reflected the light without any sign of life. Its mouth was wide open, and as the beam of light hit its face, its movements became erratic, jerking towards us at a slow speed, stumbling but trying to walk like a human would. Panic surged through me and Cliff. We turned and fled through the darkness driven by fear. We didn't stop to look back until we reached the safety of our campsite. We started shouting to the other two before we even got there. As we got to them we started screaming that we gotta go. And so I don't even know if we packed up everything, but we got the fuck out of there. I have no idea what the hell that was. But after that encounter, we decided to never go camping again. Me and my friends have talked about what we possibly encountered that night and we done research and we all came to the conclusion that it must have been a skinwalker. So let this be the last time I ever mentioned this word itself. I don't mess with skinwalkers anymore. I don't talk about them. I know they might be trending right now with TikTok. But be careful. There's a reason the Navajo people don't talk about these things. Anyways. That's pretty much it. Like I said, you might not believe me, but that I'll leave up to you. I love summer. It's my favorite time of the year. I know some people prefer a different season. And those other ones are great too. 
but for me, there's just something relaxing about a warm summer day. Almost every year or so, a few of my friends and I have a little get together. We all take some time off from work and plan some sort of event. Last year was Eric's world famous barbecue party. Everything was great until Eric set a stack of paper plates on fire and those blew into the various table covers we had arranged. We managed to curtail the fires before they had time to spread any further, but that didn't stop the fire department from showing up anyway. The year before that, Jimmy invited us over to his house for a pool party. He has a very nice in-ground pool, but none of us actually swam in it. We mostly just hung around his mini bar, just drinking and chatting away. Nothing outrageous happened during that party, except for Eric's fell cannonball attempt. I could go on and on about all the events we experienced in the past, but I'm here to talk about what happened during my event last month. Like I mentioned previously, we had all taken some time off work, and it was my turn to decide what we would all do. We usually didn't take turns choosing like this, but no one seemed to come up with a different plan. I had been browsing through different destination spots and activities around my area. After searching for around an hour or two, I stumbled across a rather interesting post. Someone was renting out a lake house about an hour's drive north. Looking through the photos and glancing over the price, I knew right away this is what I wanted to do. I called the place and I got it rented out for the weekend. The woman on the phone sounded very excited about me renting the property. After finalizing everything, I called everyone else and told them my plan. They were all almost as excited as the woman. Eric wanted to bring his grill with him so he could barbecue one day. And Jimmy brought some fishing gear so we could lounge by the lake. Our other friend Peter tagged along with us as well. He isn't a very outdoors type of person, but he still offered to come with us. We each arrived at the lake house about mid-afternoon. The sun wasn't quite setting yet, which was good as it gave us a bit of time to survey the area and inspect the house itself. The house was much larger than I expected for the price I paid to rent it. It seemed like I had gotten a really good deal. It was between the massive lake and the crowded woods behind it. Only a solitary dirt trail cuts through the tree line, leading to and from the house itself. Eric was already unloading his grill not five minutes after he arrived, while Jimmy, Peter, and I entered the house. The inside of the house was very rustic, but I knew this much from the photos. Different types of mounted animals on the high walls. The living room area was quite large. It looked almost like a recreation hall. A wooden staircase wrapped along one edge, leading up to multiple bedrooms. An expansive kitchen took up the other half of the bottom floor, as well as a decent sized bathroom. It looked like this place was designed for big groups of people to just enjoy and have fun. After exploring the house for a bit, I went outside and took in the surroundings. It was such a peaceful evening as I stood there taking in the fresh air. That's when I noticed something strange. Apart from Eric trying to mess around with his grill, there was no sound coming from the forest. I couldn't hear any birds, animals, or even insects. I could barely hear the sound from the lake nearby. Even though it was weird, I tried not to think too much of it. An hour or so passed by, and after eating some burnt steaks that Eric so graciously made for us, we each retired to our bedrooms. Sleeping in a new place always made me feel a bit nervous. I may be the only one, but whenever I stay in a hotel or at a friend's place, it always takes me forever to fall asleep, at least during the first night. This isn't really a major issue, as it doesn't keep me from traveling. The bedrooms were quite nice, minimal, yet decent. They had a small wooden frame bed, a stout dresser, and a nightstand with a small lamp. And on the far wall was a long window that overlooked the trees and the lake. I was lying there, 
letting my mind wander as my eyes danced around my room. I wasn't even staring at anything. I was just trying to take in my surroundings so I could fall asleep more easily next time. Minutes slowly ticked by, and I started to feel my eyelids close before a feint of movement out of the corner of my eye caused me to open them once again. I couldn't be sure, but I thought for a split second I saw someone standing outside my window. But that couldn't be possible, as the bedrooms were on the second floor, and it was a straight drop down to the dirt below. My eyes locked onto the window, but after focusing for a bit, there was nothing out there. The next day, we all got up bright and early. There wasn't a whole lot to do aside from wandering around the property, so that's what I did. Eric was already prepping some food, while Pete and Jimmy had started day drinking. I stood outside the wooden porch with a cup of coffee, looking out to the tree line nearby. I once again let my eyes drift around as I sipped my coffee, and once again, there wasn't any sound, which I still thought was strange. I wonder why it was so quiet in the woods, a place that is often filled with the sounds of life. As my eyes drifted, I spotted a bit of movement in the distance. It looked like something large, moving quickly through the trees. I thought it might have been a bear, but before I could adjust my gaze, whatever it was, had disappeared further into the trees. The rest of the day was uneventful. We spent most of the time down near the lake, drinking and fishing. Eric had made us some burgers, which actually weren't terrible, and before we knew it, the sun had faded. We all went to our bedrooms for the night, and I didn't have much trouble falling asleep this time around. Ten minutes after I had drifted off, I was startled awake by the sounds of screaming. My eyes cracked open and I sat up, looking around in the darkness. It took me a minute to recognize the voice. It was Jimmy. As I opened my bedroom door, I saw Eric opening his as well. We each gave each other a confused look before going to Jimmy's door and knocking. After receiving no answer, I opened his door. Jimmy? I called out. Jimmy was sitting on the floor, wide-eyed, covered in sweat. I asked him what was wrong. However, he wouldn't turn to look at me. His eyes seemed to be fixed on something else. Eric and I both glanced over in unison towards his window. And that's when I heard Eric over my shoulder shout. What the fuck is that? I didn't say anything. I just felt my muscles tighten. On the other side of Jimmy's window was a figure. It wasn't anything I had ever seen before. With the faint bit of moonlight outside, I could just barely see its face. I know this is going to sound very weird, but its face was almost dog-like in appearance. It had a long nose and beady, hollow eyes. From what I could tell, its body was completely hairless. I'm not sure if it was just the moonlight outside or what, but its skin was a dark gray color with a bluish tint to it. Its eyes continuously darted from each of us, almost like someone hopped up on caffeine. It was creepy how jittery this thing was. It felt like an eternity for all of us sitting there, watching this thing watch us. Then, it started to descend from the window. Jimmy and Eric didn't move a muscle, yet for some reason, I felt drawn to the window. I peered outside and I saw it. Despite its massive size, it crawled down the side of the house like a spider. It crawled on all fours as it made its way to the ground below. Its hands were strangely human in appearance, but its hind legs were those of an animal, like a dog or maybe a wolf. Its head turned back to look up at the house, and I could just faintly see its beady eyes darting around before it took off into the woods, disappearing beyond the darkened tree line. Eric, Jimmy, and I all sat there, staring at each other for a few moments before Peter came stumbling into the room, asking what the hell was going on. None of us said anything, but we all did end up sleeping in the same bedroom. 
for the rest of the evening. The following day, as we all packed up to leave, I couldn't help but stare at the strange footprints in the dirt leading off into the forest. What made me nervous wasn't the fact that these footprints confirmed that what we saw that night was real, but there were at least 10 more identical yet separate tracks leading off in various directions. It's been close to a month since that, and I've been trying my best to forget about the whole event. I still have no idea what that thing was, but I doubt I'll be renting any more houses by a forest. I never really knew my grandma's brother well. All I can remember is that he was a real energetic man who lived on the hill where my grandparents resided in the Navajo Res, not far from the Chaco Wash. My grandma's brother used to reside a couple of miles north of my grandparents' place. His dwelling, more like a shack, sat on the outskirts of the Badlands. When we were young, we were instructed to steer clear of this place because it was considered evil. I never questioned why. I just accepted the warning and avoided the area. As time went by, my grandma's brother passed away under strange circumstances. He was found dead in his house. Even though he would occasionally visit my grandparents, his absence for a few days was unusual. My older uncle went to his house and discovered his lifeless body. What was strange was the hasty funeral arrangements that followed. Normally, in Navajo tradition, funerals are held on the fourth day after the person's passing. But in this case, the funeral was conducted immediately without even informing the family. Curiosity led me to sneak over to his house to see what it looked like inside before it was torn down, as per my grandmother's request. The inside of the house felt eerie. It was a one-room, shed-like structure with faded and some bleached wooden boards for walls. The boards didn't fit tightly, allowing sunlight to filter in, illuminating the floating dust particles. The bed was modest, adorned with a green army blanket. There weren't that many decorations, mostly old shearing tools and knives with no photographs in sight. An old wood stove and a small table occupied the space. Alongside two crates at the far end of the room, one wooden crate laid open, revealing its contents, while the other, made of metal, was locked. After my brief exploration, I left the house, noting its vantage point overlooking the Badlands to the west. Several years passed and my older uncle decided to build his dream house on the exact site where my grandmother's brother had lived. Despite my grandmother's concerns about the location, my uncle was determined to proceed with the construction. He envisioned a single story ranch style house, equipped with all modern stuff, which was actually very rare on the res. The construction began and everything seemed to progress easy at first. However, strange occurrences soon began to fall on the workers. Tools would go missing, and they said that there would be shadows moving within the house, and blood was discovered smeared on the walls. Even stranger were the tracks found in the sand around the house, leading from the west towards the Badlands. My uncle, an experienced hunter, couldn't identify these tracks. So he looked for help with my grandpa, who also found them perplexing. Eventually, my grandma intervened, recognizing the signs of a skinwalker. She instructed my uncle on the necessary precautions, and work on the house stopped until this issue could be resolved. Despite being careful, strange events continued to happen in the house. But my uncle pressed on. He eventually completed the house. And even yet, the disturbances persisted, driving his family to discomfort and fear. Even my grandmother's attempts to calm the spirit seemed futile. 
against whatever forces were at play. On one specific evening, my cousins and I stayed over, and we experienced firsthand the strange nature of this house. The generator was shut off, and then strange noises echoed through the darkness, and it almost felt like some presence seemed to stalk us from the shadows. Only the intervention of my grandparents, armed with traditional remedies and fierce determination, brought us relief from all of this. Another incident involved my younger cousin. She was alone in the truck outside, and she said as she looked to the west side of the house, she saw a pale, humanoid figure peering down at her with dark, soulless eyes. Her screaming alerted the family to come outside, but this creature had vanished before they could confront it. Even with my grandmother, a woman of great strength, she had vowed to confront whatever was there and expelled it from the house. My grandma was very traditional and practiced native medicine. She also used sacred crystals to find and heal people. While looking into her crystals, she would also practice reading people's hands. There's been a few instances where she has been used to locate missing people and also found the circumstances of the way the person died. She also had knowledge of the evil way, the dark practice of witchcraft. In need of medicine, my grandma had acquired a few secret items and would seek help from another medicine man. They both went into the house and began a ceremony to expel whatever was in it. They went into each room blessing them with sage and sealing them with ash. When they finally went into the master bedroom, the medicine man started to vomit and bleed from the nose. My grandma said that she had a nauseous feeling and felt dizzy, almost fainting. They both retreated from the room and closed the door, sealing it with ash. The medicine man said the room was the source of evil, attracting evil spirits, including skinwalkers. He said he would try to pinpoint where the evil was coming from, but would need to go in alone. He began by lighting up a medicine bundle, taking bitter root, and marking his forehead with ash before entering the room. He described the room as very cold, feeling the presence of numerous spirits in the closet. Upon opening the closet, he saw a black mist on the floor, swirling like the eye of a black hurricane. He began the ceremony to close the portal, but was met with resistance. The medicine man heard a voice from the swirling mass, telling him that only the one who summoned the evil could close the portal. However, he continued the ceremony, and the mass started to diminish and eventually disappeared. Blessing the room with sage and corn pollen, he attached the burnt log to the top of the interior of the closet and sealed the door with ash. He warned my grandma that whatever was summoned was evil and too strong to keep under control. And so his recommendation was that my uncle abandon the house. Despite the warnings, my aunt, her boyfriend, and their three-year-old son moved into the house, believing it to be a perfectly good place to save money on rent payments. However, they soon encountered paranormal experiences. One evening, my aunt heard footsteps walking down the hallway, followed by something crawling into bed with her and her son. Whatever it was, quickly got out of bed, threw off the covers, and stepped on her boyfriend's neck, causing him to choke for air. They then decided to leave the house immediately, leaving their belongings behind. Later, my younger uncle Max and his friend Leo decided to spend the night at the house to investigate. While they were there, they experienced a terrifying encounter with different spirits, including that of a little girl and a faceless figure, making them flee the house in fear. Even after these encounters, the house has remained vacant, with strange occurrences continuing to happen, such as lights turning on despite the lack of electricity. Despite the warnings and strange events, the house stands abandoned, with its curtains drawing open, as if someone is still inside.
watching. This is my true skinwalker story. At the time of this experience, I had no knowledge, nor had I ever heard about a skinwalker. I was 19 years old, and I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, with my parents while attending community college. My sister-in-law had asked me to go with her to Tuba City, Arizona, to visit with her mother and pick up some papers. Her mother was a school teacher there on the Navajo Res. We would be staying there overnight. Her mother lived in one of those small government houses on the res. There were about three or four houses near her on a small paved street, except for a few buildings near there. It was pretty isolated. My niece and nephew were with us, and we'll call my sister-in-law Mary, my nephew Mike, and my niece Amy. Mike was only 10 years old, and Amy was 9. It was early evening when we arrived in Tuba City. We had stopped at a fast food restaurant on the way to pick up dinner to go. After arriving at the house, we all laid together at a small kitchen table. We talked and visited a while before going into the small living room to watch TV. There wasn't a lot to do there, so Mary and I decided we would take a night drive and explore around the res. I know what you're thinking. It's a very bad idea. Or a stupid idea. We drove around for about an hour and a half. Surprisingly, nothing weird happened. We were just laughing, talking, and listening to music as we drove up and down the dirt roads. After a while, we decided to head back. When arriving back home, we stayed up a little bit later, and then we decided it was time to go to bed. I slept in a small back bedroom on a twin bed next to a window with blinds. My nephew Mike slept on the floor in a sleeping bag in the same room. Mary and Amy were in the other room down the hallway. During the night, I was awakened by some strange, scratchy noises outside the window by my bed. It sounded like something was making long, slow clawing sounds down the window. Like when someone runs their nails down a chalkboard. I am a light sleeper, so this of course woke me up. I whisper out loud to my nephew Mike to wake up, asking him if he was hearing the same thing I was. Mike was sleepy and groggy, being awakened from a deep slumber, so he seemed confused at first. I asked him again if he had heard the scratching noise, but he didn't answer. He was just out of it. He then laid back down and was out like a light. I was perplexed and a little scared. I thought to myself maybe it was just a stray cat or dog, but I couldn't figure it out. I did, however, have no indication to look out that window, so I just lay there listening. After a few minutes, the clawing stopped. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew, it was morning. I mentioned this at the kitchen table during breakfast, but no one seemed very interested. We left later that afternoon, and I never even thought about it again. Six months later, I was attending one of my college courses. The teacher was lecturing us about different legends and stories of the Navajo people. He touched on the stories of evil medicine men, or witches, that are called skinwalkers. He began telling us that they are very dangerous and harmful. They have the ability to turn into or disguise themselves as any animal. They could take the form of a coyote, wolf, or even a bear. They also been known to follow people home at night. That's why you should never be out on the res after dark. You're never supposed to make eye contact with a skinwalker because they can actually possess your soul. You should never talk about them because you can draw them to you. They can cause issues and bring evil into your life. An icy chill went down my spine. I remember that night I had spent on the res. I wonder if a skinwalker had followed Mary and me home that night after our drive. The realization that a skinwalker had targeted us fills me with fear. I think of this often, and I'm so glad I didn't look out the window that night. I'm also haunted by the fact that there was just a very thin pane of glass separating me from such an evil thing. And now, 
I guess I know why no one in the family wanted to talk about it. This happened a few years ago in South Utah. My family and I have some friends that live on the Navajo Res near the bottom of Utah. Our family is in Navajo, but my parents had met some friends a while back who are. Now, my parents had always told me about the legends that their friends had told them. I was never really scared of them because, to be honest, I didn't believe they were real. Well, we had talked to our friend Joey about coming down to the res and camping with him for a few days. He was on board with the idea and we made plans to drive from Salt Lake City down to the campsite, which was about 10 miles into the res. It was a pretty normal road trip most of the way and we stopped by a few towns to take pictures and eat. But we had decided that we were going to make it to the campsite in one day. We had been driving from 6 in the morning to 3 in the morning and we were all tired as hell. I had been sleeping in the back while my father drove and was talking to my mother. My parents started to wake me up because they said we were about to pass the welcome sign to the Navajo Nation. I looked out the window and waited a few minutes before I could see the sign and kept my eyes on it until we passed. I remember watching the sign, waiting to feel the bump in the road where the pavement changes. As we passed, the back of the sign came into view and I looked over the back seat to watch the sign until it was out of sight. But when I turned around to look at it, I saw something standing behind it. It looked like a deer standing on its hind legs, but it looked broken. The entire form of the deer looked wrong and I could see that it was staring at us and I stared at it for a few seconds while it was still illuminated by our backlights. I turned back around and wanted to tell my mother what I had seen but by the look on her face I could tell that she had also seen it. My mom explained what we had both seen to my dad who said it was most likely a statue or something and that we were just tired. My mom insisted and my dad said we would ask Joey about it when we got to the campsite. While we pulled up to the campsite, Joey and two of his friends were sitting around a campfire talking. We were welcomed, hugged, and greeted each other and began setting up our tent. Once we had everything set up, my mom and I got into the same tent and started to go to sleep while my father stayed outside to talk to Joey for a little bit. I wasn't really listening as they were talking. But I started to pay attention as my dad began asking Joey about this thing that we had seen. Right as my father got to the description of it, Joey became quiet and I could hear him whispering to my father in a hurried tone. All I could hear my dad say, but we just got here. About a minute after that, my dad quickly got into the tent with us and told us that we needed to go. My mom and I were annoyed by this. That's until we saw that Joey and his friends were also packing up their stuff as quickly as they could. I asked what was going on but the only answer I could get was, just get in the damn car right now. The scariest part at that moment was the way Joey was looking around the campsite. I had never seen my dad or anybody else move so quickly and pack everything up. As soon as we got everything in the vehicles, Joey told us we needed to stay somewhere off the res and that he and his friends would escort us. He made it very clear that we needed to stay on the phone with him until we got to a hotel. We all agreed and began to drive back from where we came. It was mostly a silent ride until we started coming up on a wall of rocks in the road. As soon as we could tell what it was, Joey started screaming in the phone that we needed to either go through it or go around it, but that we needed to do it quickly. My dad drove around the rocks carefully moving the vehicle trying not to pop a tire while still trying to make it out of there quickly. As we started pulling back onto the road, that's when we heard a scream or more like a screech coming from in front of the vehicle, maybe about 50 feet away. Joey only said, keep driving, which was enough to prompt my dad into driving faster than he had ever driven before. We made it to a hotel and Joey refused to speak about what just happened. 
The only thing he said was that we needed a blessing of some sort before we left. We didn't want to, but seeing what happened earlier, we were going to go with whatever Joe we wanted. I never really believed in, well, I'm not going to say their name, but after reading up on them and comparing the stories online to my own, I firmly believe they're out there. About three weeks ago, I drove my son out to a national park for a little weekend camping trip. We took the 410 out from Tacoma into Mount Rainier, a place that my own dad used to take me when I was a kid. I wanted my son, David, who's two and a half, to find the same joy in the wilderness that I had, but I'm quite convinced that he will be terrified of the forest for the rest of his life. When we arrived on Friday, the weather was crisp, and the first signs of spring had finally made themselves known. We walked, or rather I walked with David on my shoulders, for about two, maybe about three hours from the parking lot, into a small desolated camping ground, with a pre-made fire pit. I'm not a very overprotective parent, so I let David wobble around a bit while I set up the tent. I heard David make some sounds from behind me. Now, I quickly recognize these sounds as the ones that he makes when he's excited about something. I turned around and saw him sitting in the grass, about 20 feet away, staring into the woods. Even more strange, he was doing this thing he does when he's excited about something, in which he'll start slapping both of his legs quickly. I slowly walked over while trying to keep an eye on both him and the woods at the same time, but there was nothing in the tree line that I could make out. When I was finally by his side, I asked him what he had seen, and at this, his response was, Monkey Man. He was smiling, still slapping his legs as much as I try to match his excitement like a good parent should do. Suddenly, the serenity of the woods was replaced by a sense of unease. I once again fixed my eyesight on the tree line and peered in very carefully. It was just such an incredibly strange thing for him to say. I picked David up, not wanting to leave him alone anymore, at least until I could regain some clarity, and walked into the tree line. I don't know how many of you are parents, but the last thing you want to do when you're taking your kid out for a fun weekend is to scare them. I mention this because the sensible thing might have been to hush him to tell him to keep quiet for a while. But then, I also knew that realistically, this was most likely his imagination. After a few minutes of scouting around with David up on my shoulders, I decided to return to camp. It was about 3.30, I believe, so I made us some lunch, still keeping an eye out on the space at which David had been clapping and yapping just a few minutes before. As much as I try to forget it, I just couldn't. I'm not superstitious. I don't believe in aliens, in the paranormal, or even in Bigfoot. But I suppose my parental instinct was simply in too much of a high gear for me to let it go. As the cold sun was setting, I decided to ask David a bit more about what he had seen. As I was getting the fire going, I asked him about the monkey man. I asked him if it was a big monkey man. David thought about it for a second then laughed and nodded, and then asked him if he seemed like a nice monkey man, and David, once again, started to giggle. I wasn't really sure what else to ask. I read a chapter from a book to him as he fell asleep in his sleeping bag. When I fell asleep myself, I had almost forgotten about the monkey man. I awoke in pitch darkness. The fire pit was out. I reached out to feel for David and panic struck me hard. He wasn't next to me. He wasn't even in the tent itself. With only my underwear on, I stormed out but realized it was too dark to see anything. So I dropped back into the tent and tore my flashlight out of my bag. In the meantime, I was screaming his name. With only the weak beam of a flashlight, I didn't think I would ever have to actually rely on. I pointed it around in circles, still calling out for David. 
for some reason. I ran towards the spot at which David had been so transfixed in the daytime. I shouted his name into the trees as I trotted inward into the pitch black woods. I was so desperate that I didn't even notice my feet getting scraped up by the bark and stone. After only about a minute of walking, I saw something that made me drop the flashlight. David was standing there, peering into the darkness, very still. I grabbed onto him, beginning to sob, still clutching him tightly. I picked up the flashlight again, which had been beaming at the ground, and looked around for a moment, fending off the darkness. I could see nothing around. As I carried him back looking over my shoulder, I asked him what happened. He replied that he didn't know and that he was tired. David had sleepwalked before, so I was just chalking it up to that. That night, I locked up the tent from the inside with a padlock. I only got about three hours of good rest. David himself slept like a rock, despite my trembling embrace. The following morning, I made some breakfast. David couldn't remember what happened and seemed pretty satisfied to continue the trip. I thought it would be careless to shrug off last night's events as mere sleepwalking, especially considering the monkey man business. But I also thought it would be a bit too silly to cancel the entire trip over it. So I made a promise to myself that if anything else were to happen, we would drive back to Tacoma at a moment's notice. The rest of the day was actually quite nice and it helped me take my mind off things. David was a bit upset about not having the iPad, but eventually discovered that nature can be just as cool as pixels. We made some bark boats with faces on them and sent them downstream. We watched some squirrels, listened to the birds. It was everything that I was hoping the trip would be. At dusk, when the trees stretched long shadows across the grass, David was getting too cold and too tired to play anymore, so I decided we would spend the rest of the day inside the tent. I had brought along this game where you have to trace the outline of a person with a small metal rod, and if your aim is off, it makes a funny sound, almost like that game operation. I don't remember what it was called, but David always found it funny. It's a simple game, but they told us that it helps develop motor skills. When it was David's turn, he made a mistake, and the little speaker made the sound again, and David started laughing. But what happened next filled me with a sense of fear that I doubt anything will ever match. From about 50 feet away, I heard the exact same laugh that David had made, only it was much deeper. It was almost like when you record yourself speaking and then lower the pitch down. I froze, and this time, I couldn't hide my fear from David. I could tell by his face that he had also heard it. I lifted my finger to my lips to communicate to him that we needed to be quiet. It was at this moment that I also noticed that the sun had completely set. I had also just realized how quiet the woods had become. Every second felt like an eternal minute as we sat there in the tent, absolutely still. Surrounded by thick silence, when the sound of my own heartbeat in my ears finally ceased, I leaned over slowly towards my backpack to retrieve my handgun out of it. I never go into the woods without it. I turned around to face David. I noticed that he had picked up the game again. So I sternly removed it from his hand and whispered in a stern tone, Not now, David. Then, just as I had said it, a broken voice whispered, inches away from the tent. Not, Not now, David. David. The only thing I remember happening next is that I started shooting into the fabric of the tent in the direction of the sound. David was screaming, and the gunshot rang throughout the woods. Then, I heard what sounded like some fading footsteps of something sprinting away. With my hands trembling, I opened the padlock and jumped out with a flashlight in my left hand, aiming the faint beam into the darkness. I grabbed David, stuffed everything that I could within arm's reach into the backpack, and just ran. The way back was the scariest. There was not a second at which I did not feel as if something was right behind us, ready to leap out from the darkness. 
the only thing I could say to David was, it's all right, David, you'll get the iPad soon. Nothing did ever leap out, nor did I hear anything except the rushing of the wind and the running stream by the trail side. I was so out of it that even in the car, I kept checking the back seat to see if there was something sitting behind us, ready to kill us. I'm not sure how to explain it to you or to anybody, not even David's pediatrician, about what happened. I haven't even told his mother the full story, only that I thought someone came up to our tent and that I had to fire a warning shot. Needless to say, David hasn't been the same since. He has been getting constant headaches, which might be from the damage to his ears by the gunshot. I'm not sure how to end this story. But one thing is for sure, never take your kids into Mount Rainier National Park. Some people would call me a professional outdoorsman. I spend a lot of time out in the wilderness, fishing, hiking, camping, but best of all, hunting. I love to go hunting, ever since I was a kid, even though I had my father to blame for that. While other children were out riding bikes or having sleepovers, I was clutching a rifle next to my father to stay warm in the cold mornings. My father and I spent almost every fall together up there on the mountain. He would teach me about the various wildlife and all the different types of plants, which ones were safe and which ones weren't. He also taught me how to track and how to maintain firearms. I remember the first time I saw my first buck. He stood there between two rows of trees, only 50 meters away from me. I leveled my rifle at him, looked him square in the eye, and squeezed the trigger. I missed, and the deer ran off into the woods to live another day. I felt defeated that day, but my father, even though he was strict, was very understanding of my shortcomings. He told me even the best hunters in the world miss. That made me feel better, at least a little bit. The years seemed to fly by, and I had hunted nearly every type of game in those mountains. Even though I was having fun, I never let a kill go to waste. I would always bring back what I killed to stock my freezer for the following months. After high school, I got a job working as a camp supervisor on the mountain. It wasn't anything amazing. Mostly, I would just sit there and read magazines all day, sometimes having to tell a group of frat guys to keep the noise down, or reminding the scatterbrain father to keep an eye on the campfire. Like I said, it was pretty boring stuff, but I did get to be closer to nature almost non-stop. And not to mention, the campgrounds closed at the start of the fall hunting season and reopened the following year. I had just packed up my truck and said goodbye to my mom. I did this every single year, and yet my mother would always tell me how much she worries about me. My father, on the other hand, would always tell me not to come home unless I bagged something bigger than my truck. The following morning, I woke up an hour or so before dawn, got in my truck, and drove to the mountain. I had my own personal spot I would park my truck at which was a narrow path that ended about halfway up the mountain. I hopped out, grabbed my gear, my rifle, and took a deep breath before walking into the woods. Around 20 minutes of walking, the sun had just started to creep over the horizon, its rays igniting the sky above me. That was always one of my favorite parts about being outdoors so early. I continued my hike through the terrain, over logs, and through the dense brush. It wasn't long after I arrived at a clearing. I figured this was a good place as any to set up camp for the night. Whenever I go hunting, I stay out for a few days at a time just to give me more opportunities. I had quickly set up a small one-man tent and created a small fire pit. The sun was almost directly overhead at this point. Even though I was still busy situating my surroundings, I couldn't help but feel eyes on me. I backed out of my tent, my rifle in hand, and scanned the tree line around me. Another good lesson that I picked up from when I was young was to always trust your instincts out here when you're hunting. 
I thought maybe a bear was getting too curious for its own good. I grinned at the thought of my dad's face. If I managed to actually bring back something as large as my truck. But I quickly reminded myself how dangerous these animals could be. I stood there motionless, listening, and scanning everything around me. After five minutes of nothing, I returned to my tent, but still more alert than ever. Finally satisfied with how my camp looked, I quickly scarfed down three protein bars and a bottle of water before venturing into the woods. It wasn't long before I caught the trail of a small herd of deer not too far ahead of me. I took notes of each broken twig, grazing spot, and pile of droppings along the way. Just as I was about to peek my head through some underbrush, a deer jumped out at me. This caused me to jump and fall on my back hard. Before I knew it, two more of them followed as they all scampered past me, disappearing into the woods before I could even ready my rifle. Rising to my feet, I couldn't help but notice the strange behavior. Normally, deer don't run towards a hunter like that. Usually always they run in the opposite, unless something else has scared them first. I peeked my head back through the underbrush and noticed something strange. There was a deer lying on the ground in the pool of its own blood. Its entire throat and chest seemed to have been torn from its body. I could feel a mix of curiosity and concern rise in my mind. I wonder what could have possibly done this. And I also wonder how I didn't hear it happening with how close it was. While I was lost in thought, I heard the rustling of twigs and leaves on the far end of the deer. I looked up and caught a glimpse of something, only for a moment. But whatever it was, it looked gray. Maybe a wolf. But it still doesn't explain why I didn't hear it, nor why it didn't stick around to eat its prey. I decided it was best to start making my way back to camp. The sun was now on its descent, and I didn't want to be out in the woods after dark. It's very easy to get lost at night. The twilight was growing in the sky with each passing moment. I tried to quicken my pace, but I knew I wasn't going to make it back to camp before the sun had fully set. Still, I continued on, trying my best not to think about the possibility of a wolf lurking around, because if there's one, there's most likely a pack around. I began to get that feeling again of somebody's eyes on me. From some unknown location, I could feel my hands gripping my rifle as I continued to walk. Then, a rustling of leaves and crackling of twigs caused me to stop and aim with my rifle. It was two squirrels chasing each other around the tree. With a heavy sigh of relief, I lowered my guard and turned back. But when I did, I saw something that froze me. There was something attached to the tree directly in front of me. It looked like a man, but not really. Its body was a grayish blue color, and it was gripping onto the tree with large claw-like fingers. I felt sweat run down the side of my face despite the cold temperature outside. Its head was twitching about as if it were looking for something. Slowly, I raised my rifle towards it, but when I did this, it caused the creature to stop twitching its head and look directly at me. Its eyes seemed to reflect the light from some unknown source. They shimmered lightly in the dusk. I wasn't sure what I was actually looking at, but my instinct told me that it wasn't friendly. I steadied my breath, lined up the shot, and fired. The gunshot echoed through the forest as birds and other creatures scurried away from the sound. The bullet hit the creature, and when it did, a new sound replaced the gunshot. The creature let out a shriek, a chamber another round, not wanting to take a chance. Yet when I did, the creature was gone. I scanned the trees and the nearby ground, but there was no sign of it. I know I had hit it, but I wasn't about to stick around to make sure. I continued my journey back to camp, but when I got there, I found my entire campsite completely ransacked. My tent was shredded and all my supplies had been scattered about. Just then, I heard something behind me. I slowly turned and was only a few feet away from this creature that I had just shot. It was on all fours, 
crawling, still twitching its head as it moved. I could see it much more clearly now, even with the light missing from the sky. The skin on its mouth looked torn, and its jaw was hanging loosely as it was breathing silently. Its eyes were completely white, almost as if it were blind. I shifted my body slightly to face the creature, and when I did, it stopped crawling. Its milky eyes were looking directly into mine, and in a split second, I pulled my rifle up and fired, but that didn't do anything to stop it. It leaped through the air and knocked me down. Its large claw-like fingers were scraping at me while its mouth, filled with razor-sharp teeth, snapped in my face. I was trying my hardest to keep it from biting me by holding it back with the body of my rifle, but this thing was strong. I rocked from one side to the other and used the momentum to throw the creature off of me. It scrambled to its feet, but I was faster this time. I took a quick breath and squeezed the trigger, catching the creature in the head. It wheezed and fell back. That's when I got up and began running towards my truck. I looked back only once, and when I did, of course, I saw no sign of the creature I had just shot. Panic set in as I jumped over logs and tore my clothing on branches. I was just praying that I was going the correct way the entire time. As I was running, I started to feel more and more eyes on me, as if the entire mountain was now aware of my presence. I went around a small hill and almost screamed when I saw my truck. I got into it and drove out of there. When I made it home, my mother was happy, and my father was concerned at all my cuts and wounds. I told him that a bear had attacked me and that I had narrowly made it back. I couldn't bring myself to tell them what I really saw up there. Weeks went by and I couldn't shake what I had experienced. I doubt I ever will. I have since quit my job at the campgrounds and have started looking for jobs closer to town. I have hunted everything up on that mountain. But that night was the first time that something had hunted me. I don't think I'm ever going to go back to that mountain. And if you plan on going into the wilderness, be careful. A wolf or a bear aren't the only things lurking within the trees. I've been a park ranger for the better part of a decade. It's both a demanding job and one filled with enjoyment. I'm sure some people out there don't care too much about the great outdoors, but I do. I remember back when I was a kid, I would spend countless summers begging my parents to take me camping at the park. My mother wasn't too thrilled with the idea, but my father would still take me, even if she wasn't up to it. My dad and I would spend almost every summer out in the woods, hiking and fishing. It was the age-old cliché of father-son bonding time. But I suppose it's a cliché for a reason, right? I never grew tired of it, even as I grew up. Eventually, I learned that you could make a living working in a place like this. At the time, I had very little concept of park rangers and what they do. To me as a kid, I just thought that there were police officers with funny hats. Don't tell anyone, but I still kind of think that. After high school, I went to college, and during my last two years, I was lucky enough to get a job as an intern at a park not too far from the school. I would mostly do errands, but often the rangers would take me out on ride-alongs. We would drive around in a pickup truck and just enjoy the scenery. Sometimes, they would have to tell a couple of people to hit the bricks, but other than that, everything else was a breeze. After finishing college, I applied to become a ranger myself and was lucky enough to be selected. It's a highly competitive market, so being chosen was huge for me. My very first day on the job, I'll never forget it, mostly because everyone I worked with never let me forget it. I was walking out of the ranger lookout. I guess I wasn't paying attention and I missed a step. I tumbled down the stairs, spilling my coffee all over me. I swear the laughing could be heard for miles. Aside from that unfortunate misstep, it's been an enjoyable ride, to say the least. Over the course of my career, I dealt with numerous events. The first major one that I could remember would have to be the time a group of kids 
had gotten a hold of some fireworks, which aren't permitted in the park. They had set a few of them off, and we were called out to investigate. We arrived at the location not long after the report was made, and lucky for everybody, no damage was done to the park or the kids. We escorted them back and called their parents to come pick them up. One kid damn nearly wet his pants when I told him that I spoke with his mom. I couldn't blame him. She sounded like the wrath of God even when she was speaking to me. Other than that, there have been a few domestic disputes at the nearby campgrounds. Those happen actually quite frequently. People often get stupid when they get drunk. So we calmed them down or asked them to leave. And since they don't want to pick up camp, most of the time they just go to sleep. But the worst day was a couple of years ago when a local kid from a nearby town had gone missing. We were all called in to be part of the search effort. Apparently, the boy had wandered into the woods and had gotten lost. We searched and searched for days, but in the end, were unsuccessful. I still remember his face on the flyer that his parents had made. But that brings me to the scariest day working as a park ranger. I'm sure that's why you're all listening anyway. It was a slower day in between spring break and summer vacation. During that time, there's a lot of visitors, so our roster was somewhat spread out. Not to mention, we had some people retire recently, which actually left us pretty short-handed. I was stationed in the main ranger building at the entrance of the park, while Alan, another ranger, would be at the lookout further inward. After checking in and getting situated at the start of my shift, I watched out of one of the nearby windows as Alan hopped in one of the trucks and drove it to the lookout. I waited around 10 minutes before getting on the radio and telling him that one of his taillights was out. Another few minutes passed before he hopped on the radio and told me that he was halfway up the stairs, then had to head back down to check, and they were both fine. I laughed through the receiver, and I could hear him already pulling a prank on me. The day progressed and I did a few patrols in the mornings, just to take some time to enjoy my surroundings. The nearby lake was glistening with the morning sun. Along the trail, I saw two hikers who returned the friendly wave as I drove by. I stopped by the campgrounds to see if we had any new campers, and was surprised to find it empty. Regardless of the time of year, there's at least one die-hard outdoors person staying here, but not this time. I didn't pay it much mind. After all, it was less work for me. Once noon rolled around, a massive cloud seemed to appear out of nowhere. They didn't look to be storm clouds, but were thick enough to block out the sun's rays. I dreaded having to drive around in the rain, so I hoped the weather would be okay. Nighttime was fast approaching as the overcast sun descended. I radioed to Alan to see if everything was fine and he reported nothing out of the ordinary. The park after sunset was very beautiful. The stars that normally fill the night sky are a sight to behold, and the sounds of the nocturnal forest coming to life as a sound is something I'll never forget. About an hour after sunset, Alan got on the radio. Hey, John, Alan said. What's up? I replied. Come. Out here, man, he said. The way Alan spoke was strange to me. He sounded a bit nervous, a little bit off. Maybe his nerves were getting the best of him. All right, I'll be out there in a minute, I said as I exited the ranger station and hopped into the truck. As I drove out to the lookout, I radio Alan again to ask him if everything was all right. But the radio just crackled in response. I sighed thinking he might be using the bathroom or something. Once there, I parked a few yards away from the tower's base. I hopped out of the truck and turned on my flashlight. As I was approaching the stairs, my boots sloshed into the muddy ground. This caught me off guard, as even though there were clouds in the sky all day, it hadn't rained a single time. I lowered my light and saw that the ground had a strange tint to the mud. What was weird was that as I looked at it, I noticed that the muddy ground seemed to lead away from the tower. I followed it to a nearby tree line that surrounded the tower itself. In between two trees, I saw him. Alan, or what was left of him. 
His body was torn to shreds. His face was completely torn. If not for his uniform, I doubt I would have recognized him. As I was standing over in my bloody co-worker, the radio crackled to life. Hello, John. Alan's voice came through. My breathing stopped. Are you almost here? He asked. The voice coming through the radio was definitely Alan's. But that was impossible. As I was currently staring at his remains, I snapped my head and looked up to the tower above me. Even though it was dark outside, I could see someone inside of it. A silhouette standing still through the glass. I then got on the radio. Alan, are you in the tower? Yes, came the response. As soon as whoever it was responded, I made a dash to my truck. As I ran, I looked up and watched this thing run towards the tower's door and begin to descend the stairs. I barely managed to jump inside a truck before whatever it was reached the bottom. I quickly started the engine. To this day, I'm still not sure what was standing in front of me. Its skin was gray from head to toe. Its body seemed muscular, yet lanky at the same time. Long arms and legs protruded out from its torso. I could see the flesh expand and contract with each ragged breath it took. Its face was by far the strangest. Large eyes. The lower half of its face was just a mesh of teeth. Some even puncturing its own skin. It raised a long, clawed hand to its mouth. And I could see it was holding something. Suddenly, my radio crackled to life. It said in Alan's voice, John, are you there? I floored my truck and ran into the creature as hard as I could. The metal on the truck creaked for a moment before the thing fell to the ground. After that, I reversed out of there, spinning the truck around and driving until I was completely out of the park. I was interviewed by different law enforcement agencies about the events of that night. I tried my best to be honest, but hearing myself explain to the local police that it was a monster sounded insane. The authorities determined that it was most likely an individual who was crazy that attacked Alan. And when they went to go find him, he was nowhere to be found. It's been almost a year since that day, and I have since moved four states away, getting a job at a smaller park. Some of you might think that's crazy, but I do still love the outdoors. I just refuse to work once the sun goes down. I try to look up reports of similar incidents, and the closest thing I could find were stories, or legends about strange creatures that are called wendigos, the rake, or skinwalkers. I have no idea if that's what I saw that night or not, but here's some advice. If any of you are planning to visit one of your state parks this summer, I would highly recommend it. However, if you're planning on camping at one overnight, please be very careful and never trust the voice when you can't see its face. I was introduced to the world of woodworking at a young age. Of course, by my own father, a master of his craft. As a young boy, I watched my father's skilled hands transform rough timbers of wood into works of art each piece bearing the imprint of his passion and expertise. Together, we would spend countless hours in the workshop surrounded by the tools of our trade and inspired by the possibilities that lay within each piece of wood. From the simple joys of carving a small piece of wood into something artistic and to wood carving big designs. My dad passed away a few years later and had left his workshop for me. My mom told me that my dad always had a passion for me to follow in his footsteps. Decades went by, and I grew up working on side projects as a hobby, selling them on Craigslist, Marketplace, Etsy, and even building custom stuff for the community. There was nothing like being in a workshop and building something from scratch with your own bare hands. I received a request from a local library that they had old furniture they were trying to restore and set up for viewing. I went over and looked at the furniture they wanted me to bring to life and I knew I could do it. 
I was just missing some detailed shaper tools that had finally given up on me. I found some replacements, but they weren't going to get here until a month later. I knew I couldn't wait this long. I asked a friend of mine if he knew anyone who had access to some of the tools that I needed. He said he knows a guy from work that would be happy to help. And apparently, he was interested in the same stuff that I was. But he did warn me that he's a little bit... off. One morning, I drove my friend to work, so he introduced me to the guy. He seems pretty distant and withdrawn from all the others. He shakes my hand, and we end up talking a little bit. He does seem really interested in the woodwork that I was doing, and we talked about different projects and such for a little while, talking about things we learned and the tools that we used. The guy warms up after a bit, and I ask him if it would be alright if I checked out some of his stuff. He kind of agrees, but it's one of those responses when somebody is trying to come up with an excuse, but they just came. He tells me to swing by that night. He says we can talk over a few beers. That sounds good to me, but later that night, I get a call. It's the guy. He sounds very shaken up. He says things are crazy at home, and right now it's in a good time. There is a lot of noise in the background, and so he says that he will call me when things calm down. He didn't call me the next day, nor the day after. It's not until I was ready to return the tool that I had borrowed that he calls one afternoon. He says that things have settled down for now and that he wants me to bring over some of my own work as well to compare and all that stuff. He gives me his address and I say sure and I start to head over. I quickly notice that this guy lives in the middle of nowhere. I had to call him up a few times just to find the house because it was nothing but narrow backcountry dirt roads. The house was at the end of a very long driveway and you go from dirt trails to beautiful acres of land. The driveway is littered with trees, and his house is actually pretty nice. As I come up the driveway, something strikes me as strange about the trees that I'm passing up. They all have faces carved into them, facing the driveway, twisted, painful looking expressions. I didn't think too much of it, because sometimes I make morbid stuff myself, and in fact, I was quite impressed. I mean, I have all types of scary stuff in my house. However, the amount of detail was staggering. Looking out into the tree line of the property, every tree had a painted face looking into the house, almost like the woods were watching you wherever you were. This kind of creeped me out. Looking out was like seeing a hundred or so white faces, just crying out in pain, kind of like they wanted your attention. I knock on the door. The guy answers with a beer in hand. He's actually much friendlier than before. He helps me carry some of my stuff in and shows me around. He seems pretty cool. I begin to notice that each room has one of those down faces hanging above the door frame. The more I saw them, the more I began to feel creeped out. Not only was I in the middle of nowhere, but something just felt off. Up close. The faces were more detailed than I had imagined. I asked him what his focus on the faces were for, and the guy kind of tensed up and dodged my question. Upon entering the workshop, which was super sweet by the way, he seemed to have an interest besides creepy faces. He had entire seven foot sculptures of women, men, animals, all of them very well done. And there's another large one in the back of his workshop that has a tarp over it. He looks at me, almost with a worried look, and says that that one isn't done yet. But the way he says it makes me not want to press further. It was right in front of a door that I think led to another room. We began working on stuff together, trading stories and fun times about when we injured ourselves. Suddenly, out of nowhere, he changes the subject. The guy starts to ask me what I think about God and the afterlife. I tell him that I'm not super religious, but I don't rule anything out. I just don't go to church or anything. The guy gets a bit flustered by this, gets a bit loud. He says that he was told that everything was a lie. So I ask him, by who? He's kind of silent for a moment. And then he asked me if I believe in spirits. I gave him the same kind of answer. It's possible. 
I don't rule anything out. He then starts looking around the room as if seeing if anyone is around. Then he leans towards me and his voice goes soft and he whispers. I see things in the woods at dusk. I can see their shadows. Sometimes they whisper from the trees and I can hear them. I start to think that this guy is obviously mentally disturbed given everything else, but I continue listening. I try to ask him what they tell him. They tell him that everything is a lie, that God is a lie, that afterlife is a lie. The only thing after dying is darkness. He says that they laugh at him and that they leave dead animals at his tree line. At this point, I'm officially freaked out. He says sometimes they visit him at night and each face carving represents a different spirit that has came to visit him. He says that they can stand looking at themselves in death so they don't step within the tree line, which is why he has the entire thing carved out. I'm pretty quiet at this point. I hadn't felt goosebumps like this ever since I was a kid and I had chills running up my spine. He told me that they try to talk to him from the tree line at night, that they try to get him to leave his home. I try to change the subject, but the guy looks down and just keeps talking. He starts to get pale as a she, and from what I can tell, he's actually terrified. He even kind of starts looking at me with tears in his eyes. He tells me that I'm the only person he's told. Knowing that I'm a stranger, he apologizes. He says that he's scared and doesn't know what to do anymore. I try my best to awkwardly console this stranger and the guy kind of starts to break down. Personally, I think he needs help, but I know it's not my place to try to help him, and so I regret to this day the next thing I ask. Why he's so afraid, he looks at me and says that the faces are not working anymore. Two weeks ago, he had something terrible in his living room. I ask him what it was. He walks over to the figure that's covered with the tarp and pulls it off and he reveals the most mangled, terrible thing I have ever seen. It barely resembles a human being. Shortly after this, there's a loud bang on the wall to my right. I nearly jumped out of my skin, but the guy didn't even look. Then again, another bang and then it just continue on and on. The guy then screams towards where the noise is coming from. Stop, Stop it. it. And it ceases. After that, I just grab my stuff. I tell the guy that I'm sorry and that I have to get out of here. I fucking got out of there as quickly as possible. As I'm leaving his home and driveway, I look in the rear view mirror and the trees are darker than I ever seen. They have shadows all around them. I end up making it back home and the guy calls me a week later and apologizes. He said he was just being silly and everything is okay now and that most of it was just a joke. However, I told our mutual friend what happened and he told me that the guy actually quit and that nobody has heard from him nor could they get a hold of him after that. This is something that happened to me a few decades ago. It's been such a long time. But I like to share this experience with everybody who likes to go hiking or walking or camping in the Appalachian Trail. Way back when I was in my mid-twenties, in the late 1980s, I used to be hardcore into hiking and camping. But given that my home state of Rhode Island is like the size of a postage stamp, I exhausted a lot of the more local campgrounds pretty quickly and began to long for something a little bit more on the wild side. I heard a lot of great things about the Appalachian Trail. Hiking it was a badge of honor for a lot of people who shared my passion for the outdoors. My uncle on my dad's side had hiked the whole thing over the course of a summer back in the 50s and he would never shut up about it whenever he would see me. He made it sound amazing. Like there was true wilderness out there, just waiting to be explored. So I made up my mind to mimic the journey that my uncle took over one summer. I couldn't get the time off work to walk the whole trail, but if I timed it correctly, 
I could walk the southern portion of the trail from Harper's Ferry to Asheville, North Carolina in just a couple of weeks, fulfilling a hiking dream that I had for what seemed like an age. Then, in the summer of 1989, I traveled down to Harper's Ferry by bus and by train with all my hiking and camping gear on my back. After picking up a few final supplies for my journey south, I hiked up onto the Appalachian Trail and kicked off the journey of a lifetime. Needless to say, the first few days of walking were pretty tough, but I got used to the level of strain pretty quickly. I'm telling you, I've never been as hungry or tired as I was on those first few nights up in Appalachia. I brought a hammock with me as I heard some pretty intense stories about the bugs down in West Virginia. Nasty little bugs with the names like the Assassin Bug, which basically has a big spike for a mouth, or the Cow Killer Ants, whose stings are so painful that they are said to have taken down an actual cow. This had to be pure rumor, but it was intimidating. So every night after my day's hike, I would take it out of my pack, unroll it, and tie it up between two trees before getting some shut-eye. It didn't make for the comfiest night's sleep I ever had, but I wasn't complaining, especially if I was able to keep the black widows off of me. But since I was out in the woods most nights, without cover, every little sound or squawk from the nightly animals would wake me up. It was irritating, sure, but it was part of being out there, bonding with nature, you can say. So this one night, I wake up pretty sure that I heard something rustling in the leaves close by. I shifted my hammock, peering over my shoulder, and then I felt my blood run cold as I saw this big dark shape looming over me. I froze for a second, feeling my eyes adjust to the darkness, and I could tell that it was a person just standing there, staring at me. In one fluid motion, I rolled out of my hammock and hit the ground running, bolting off into the trees. I didn't care who it was standing over me. Whoever does that kind of creepy shit did not have the best intentions, and I wasn't about to stick around and make small talk. I ran a safe distance into the woods, caught my breath, circled around, and then I started to sneak back towards my camp. My intention was to make sure it was clear before gathering up my stuff and moving on to a safer spot. I took it slowly, scanning the darkness for any sign of the shadowy figure, eventually finding my way back to camp, only to discover it was completely untouched, with all my gear still in the same spots. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that whoever had been standing over me just backed off to watch from a distance and was going to wait for me to come back and get my stuff before trying to ambush me. If they weren't there to steal from me, it was obvious something else they wanted, and I was dreading to think exactly what that was. But regardless, I managed to grab my stuff and get out of the area without anyone managing to sneak up on me. The next few days, I walked hard and fast, exhausting myself in my attempt to get as far away from the area as possible. After that, I figured I was safe. No one had bothered me during the previous few days of hiking, so I figured I would be okay from there on out. But I was wrong. Very wrong. Every single night since that incident, I struggled to get some sleep. I kept picturing that person standing over me, just staring down at me in the darkness. I had no idea how long they'd been there, or what they had in mind for me. And I was just glad that I got out of the area. But still, I then started to feel safe again, until I bought some fishing line from a sporting goods store in one of the small towns I had passed, which I could then use to make trip wires that ran between the trees close to where I was camping. Then, a couple of empty cans of beans that I would string together, and whoever snagged their foot on the wire would make the cans clank together, making me aware of their presence. I had one big scare when a fox snagged the line, and I rolled out of my hammock with a knife in hand ready to take on whoever was about to creep up on me, only to see the furry little guy scurrying away into the moonlight. I did end up laughing to myself about that one, and after that, I stopped sleeping with my knife in hand, because all it was gonna take was one little slip, and I would be in a whole world of trouble. About a week went by, and I had just about gotten over the whole shadowy figure in the night incident, 
I had to be almost 100 miles away from where it took place. And I had no more trouble on any other night. Except for the incident with the fantastic Mr. Fox that just scared the life out of me. So with the help of my little tripwire alert device, I was able to start getting some sleep again without any trouble. However, that night, I woke up suddenly to find that I couldn't move. I couldn't bring my arms up from my sides at all. And the hammock material seemed to be pushed right into my face. I was cocooned by it, like the fabrics was wrapped around my entire body. This only registered in my half-awake brain when I heard the sound of fabric snapping. Then, I hit the dirt, completely knocking the wind out of me. I had no idea what was going on, struggling to break out of the hammock, only I couldn't. That's when I felt the hammock being dragged across the forest floor. Then, it hit me. Whoever was dragging me across the ground had bundled me up in my own hammock with some kind of cord. They had cut the ropes tying me to the tree and was proceeding to drag me off to God knows where. I started screaming at the very top of my lungs, forever it seemed like, to let me out. But no one responded. All I could hear was the sound of the hammock's fabric rustling against the forest floor. I knew I had to think fast, or whatever was going on wasn't going to end well at all. Like I said, I had stopped sleeping with my knife in my hand, or nearby me in the hammock because that was just an accident waiting to happen. So I had nothing handy to cut through the material and make my escape, or so I thought. In a split second, one idea popped up. A few years back, my dad had gifted his old wristwatch to me. It was a reliable thing, but I had just one complaint about it. The little latch that kept it tied to my wrist and was actually a little sharp from the years of use. I managed to accidentally poke myself a few times within the process of picking it up or even putting it on. It actually drew blood, so I knew what I had to do. I unbuckled the watch as quickly as I could, which wasn't easy considering I was getting dragged along the ground in the pitch darkness, and managing to pinch the sharp clasp between my thumb and index finger was even harder. But still, I managed. And when I did, I began to rake it against the fabric of the hammock. It was just as effective at cutting canvas as it was at cutting skin. And even though it took a good few tries, it didn't take long until I could see the subtle glow of the silvery moonlight from the other side. I kept cutting as quickly and quietly as I could, until there were so many cuts that I could rip myself out of this cocoon, like some terrified newborn bursting out of the womb. You'll have to excuse the analogy. But in retrospect, that's exactly what it seemed like happened. I was born again that night. I got a second chance at living. Escaping that hammock meant life because I know that staying in it would have meant death. For the second time in about 10 days, I found myself bounding through the dark woods. Only that second time, the fear I had was like 10 times what I felt the first time around. I don't even know how I managed to escape. Assuming it was the same figure standing over me the first night, they had somehow managed to track me for more than a hundred miles. And they even seemed to get past my trip wires. They were a far better woodsman than me, most likely more physically fit than me. I just know that by the time I reached the house with its lights on, I turned to look behind me as I was banging on the door. There was no one else around, and the family who lived there were kind enough to put me up for the night. After I called the local sheriff, who came out in the morning to help me retrace my steps through the woods. We found my camp, but not the hammock. And even though I told him everything in detail, I could tell he was very skeptical of my story. He even suggested that I most likely got lost and scared in the dark and had just ended up jumping at shadows. Maybe even had a bad dream that seemed a little too vivid because of the lack of proper rest. But I know this was real, just in the way my palms are sweating right now as I'm recounting this. I'm sure that night really did happen the way I remember it. I never did finish that dream hike. The next day, I got on a bus back to Harper's Ferry, then took the train all the way back to Providence. And I only ever told a handful of people who happened to be out on the trails. I figured not many would really believe me. They would just think I was telling a campfire tale or something. I didn't tell my hiking uncle for the longest time. I thought that maybe he was just gonna laugh. 
or tell me that I didn't have it in me to do something that tough. But when I finally told him my story, I got a reaction that I definitely wasn't expecting. He just nodded and he told me that there were some nights that he himself didn't think that he would make it out alive. He said that there are people who live up in those mountains who have been outlaws for generations, who live isolated outside of the natural order of things. He has some pretty close calls himself at times, bumping into people who weren't nearly as friendly as the majority of West Virginians, and sometimes even seeing things that he knew he wasn't supposed to see. But just what those things were, he didn't seem to want to say. I always told myself that I would try my little Appalachian adventure some other time. Maybe when I'm a little bit more old, a little more wise, the trail will still be there, waiting for me. But then again, so will whoever try to drag me off that night. Growing up, I always had a thing for walking alone in the woods. I was a creative writer in school. My attention span now is far too gone to finish much writing these days. But back then, I would take a stroll through the woods to get my writing done. Just me, a pencil, and a notebook. Sometimes I would even listen to Silent Hill and Parasite Eve soundtracks. Some of those soundtracks were pretty creepy too. Yet it never creeped me out being alone in the woods listening to creepy music. I never did feel afraid. The single experience, however, has left me with the feeling of dread at the mere thought of going back into the woods alone. I still venture out there, but that peace of mind I used to have just isn't there anymore. I work at a call center, have weekends off, and I was single at the time with not too many friends. I would spend my weekends hiking and camping along the Appalachian Trail. I lived only two hours from it, and the drive itself was usually quite relaxing too. Hiking and camping alone can be difficult, and it's not something I would recommend for inexperienced hikers. Even if you follow a forecast, the weather can switch upon you when you least expect. The rare large animal encounter can happen. And sometimes you can put yourself in a very dangerous situation when you got no one with you. I sprained my ankle once on a trail in the nearby mountains. I was miles deep, and having gone in alone, I had to trek back, limping all the way. Not a fun experience at all. On a cloudy Saturday morning, I woke up early and ventured forth to the Appalachian Trail. After a couple of hours of a drive, I finally arrived. No rain at all, just yet. Even though the sky would remain overcast for my journey, I had planned on a one night camping trip, not going too deep. I had some plans the following day for my sister's baby shower, and I didn't plan on missing it. The hiking was fairly smooth. The air that day was just the right pressure and not too humid. It was an especially comfortable hike. I never would have expected what was gonna transpire. I hunkered down under a poplar tree, tearing down a cliff bar, then finished off my first bottle of water. I looked around as I enjoyed my meal, trying to remember the names of the numerous different trees and shrubs around me. Then I thought about a meeting I would have to come in early for on Tuesday. It was around then that I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. I saw a human figure at the top of a dead tree about 20 yards to my right. It was small. I could very clearly make out a small coat, pants, shoes, and hair. What in the world? I wondered. My heart raced as I picked myself up and ran over towards the tree. Surely I wasn't seeing a child stuck at the very tip top of a tree in the Appalachian Trail, right? It was the most bizarre thing. I definitely panicked, to be honest. If this child fell from that height, they could be her, if they weren't already, that is. I mean, the figure wasn't moving at all except for their clothes blowing in the wind. Hey, you okay? I called up. No response, and there was no movement. I go, my heart sinking a little further. You might be thinking I should have called for help then, but I had a habit of leaving my phone in the car. I don't like looking at my screen too often, so on short hikes I like to leave it behind. 
I was only going to be out overnight, so I thought I wouldn't need it. I made a quick decision and I began to climb. I was in decent shape, sure, but I hadn't climbed a tree since I was, what, 12 or 13? Lucky for me, this tree was nearly perfect for climbing branches all in the right places. It was only recently dead too, so none of it felt brittle yet. I had to stop several times, but eventually, exhausted, I made it close enough to the figure to reach out and touch their shoe. I poked the bottom of one of their shoes, trying to get their attention or get a response. The shoe fell the moment my finger touched it. Underneath, there was no sock, no foot. I looked closer at the rest of the figure. There was no person inside the clothes. The coat and pants were empty, and the hair, well that was especially weird. I reached up, nearly losing my hold on the tree, and inside the hood of the coat was in fact very real human hair, long and straight like it belonged to a young girl, but the strand I pulled wasn't attached to anything. I could see flakes of skin on the end of the strands, as if the hair had been yanked from someone's head. I felt vomit rising from my stomach before I could react further, and then... I heard something below me, footsteps, slow and heavy, then there was a whisper, just a bit louder than the wind itself, the voice sounded feminine, but somehow it sounded closer to me, as if the speaker was on a nearby branch, come down, it came again suddenly after about 10 minutes of silence, I was at my limit. Then I tried resting myself on the branch below me, but it was too thin, forcing me to press my feet and legs onto it to keep my back steady against the trunk. There was no position in which I could rest. I had to get down, come down. Again, I heard the whisper. The footsteps came again too. They seemed to be just below me at the bottom of the tree. But when I looked, I saw no one. I climbed down to the next branch with my legs still wobbling. I was confident I could jump down without being hurt. I inhaled. I remember thinking, just go. And jumping at the same time. I hit the ground with both of my knees popping but I knew I was fine. And I started running as quickly as I could down the trail the way I came. I didn't even look back. I have no idea how I was even allowed to leave. Whatever I had encountered out there felt so evil, but I ran until I saw another person whose expression was one of confusion. I smiled and just continued past them. Back at my car, I called the ranger station with my phone, which had been waiting for me in the glove compartment. I reported what I found and where I found it. I couldn't help but think that maybe I should have ran instead of climbing that tree, but the idea of this poor child falling from a wall was gone, trying to find them help was just eating at me. Now, knowing there was no child, I felt as if I had been baited. Some part of me was telling me something had laid a trap for me. Then again, why was I allowed to leave? That was the last of it. I never heard back from anyone about this encounter. I never even heard of a similar experience. And I see no news reports about a missing child. In the end, a fear of the woods now lingers with me, and I'll be staying far away from the Appalachian Trail for the time being. I went to Santa Clara, New Mexico, to watch my Zuni friend perform the deer dance with a group. The Zuni Pueblo dancers are known for their brightly colored clothing and beautiful dancing. One of their dances is called the deer dance. I actually live about an hour away from here, which is why he invited me since I was not that far. As I was there, I saw the dancers wearing bells on their ankles, and they used sticks with bells to stomp the ground. It was beautiful, as these dancers, the singing, and the rhythm had a distinctive sound to them. After the quote-unquote show, which I ended up finding out was an actual ceremony, my friend drove me back to his place. He lives pretty close to the river and is actually like the last line of houses before you go to the forest. So we stayed in his car a while 
just talking about life in general. Anyways, my friend said that he needed to go inside and change and then he would drop me off at my house. So we got out of the car and he went inside. And as I'm standing outside waiting for him, I started to hear bells, similar to the ones from the ceremony. So I looked around but couldn't really see anything. Then I realized it was the same sound and pattern that the dancers' bells were making. I knew there should be nobody dancing this late, for it was around 10 p.m., so I thought it was weird. I started looking around to see where these sounds were coming from. They sounded pretty distant, but I still looked around to see if I could spot it. As I was looking down the block from where the porch light couldn't reach, there was a stop sign, and right next to the stop sign was where the sound of the bells was coming from. I see a silhouette of a person dancing. It looked to be wearing similar deer dancer attire, similar to the clothing that my friend and some of the people I saw earlier. Except that this looked strange. My friend had given me some background on all of this, and he told me that they wear leathers and skins. But this one looked like it was wearing something different. Something was off about it, so I stood there watching it. I almost felt like I was in a trance with its dancing. Then I realized that this person was almost as tall as the stop sign. So I focused more on it. And I realized that it was dancing like it wanted me to see it. Then I noticed that it started to move slowly towards me. At very slow steps. Almost dancing from one side to the other. But as it was getting closer, I started to distinguish it more. It had huge horns. The torso was like a barrel. The arms were long and lanky, similar to its legs. This is when fear starts to build up inside of me, and I try to move, but I almost feel like I'm stuck, just staring at this thing. That's when my friend comes out of the house and is asking me what that noise is. Me being stuck just staring at it. I couldn't say anything. Then he sees it and starts screaming at it in some language I had never heard. He tells me to get inside the house quickly. I go inside the house and I see him follow right behind me. Then he comes inside and I'm asking him what the hell that was. And he just looks at me and says that it was Adegashi. He calls his mom in his native language. She comes from her room and looks at me with concern and then makes a phone call. Moments later, my friend told me, a medicine man is on his way over here and he's going to perform a smudging ceremony. It's a cleansing. We need to purify the space and have him bless both of us. His mom then lights something in the living room and closes all the blinds and windows and locks the doors. After about 15 minutes, a knock is at the door and it's this old man who has a bunch of bags and is wearing old traditional native clothing. My friend's mom quickly locks the door and has both of us sit down on the floor together. Without saying a word, the medicine man starts to light something and goes around shouting some words, almost like he was singing. I'm not exactly sure what is going on, but this only lasts like five minutes. He then tells us to get up and gets close to me and says, they have took notice of you. Leave this place quickly. My friend then quickly gathers everything and he tells me that he's gonna go drop me off right now. Yeah, in the middle of the fucking night. Back home. As we're on our way back to my place, my friend explains everything. He says that Aldegashi is a term for a witch and that this witch was trying to cause harm and was actually pretty close to doing so. Something about that these witches communicate with Chendis and that they took notice of me and were now going to pursue me unless I left town. He said that when the elders in town say something, we must listen for they know what is best for us. He said he would keep me updated but to not come back into town no matter how much time has gone by. In the summer of 2015, I was going on a fishing trip with my dad and three friends, Peter, Andrew, and Jason. 
we live in North Indiana. So we ended up going to Lake Patoka Marina. My dad invites his friend that he always gets drunk with. And I think, well, it'll be a good time for all of us to chill in the woods or something. So us younglings agree that once we get there, we're going to leave and explore the woods a little bit. We get there a little bit later in the day, around 5 o'clock. Dad decides not to fish until the next morning, and so he decides to get drunk with his friend in the cabin, like they ran it for all of us for the night. This is the perfect time for us to leave. My dad doesn't mind that we take his truck. He just says to come back before midnight. My dad wouldn't let me leave like this, but he's getting drunk with his friends, so it's whatever. We drive around some random roads, and eventually, we get to road 231. We then continue down this road until we notice that it stops. It stops, but there's woods all around. This is where we decide to get off. Now, I do want to point out that it was sunset by this point. So we walk into the woods, ignoring that anything paranormal or any crackhead hillbillies will try to do anything to us. We walk for about 30 minutes. It's definitely dark now, especially this deep in the woods. We had two flashlights and our phone lights, but it was still pretty dark even with that. We then come to this weird looking cut down tree and my friends decide that they wanted to smoke a blunt, but I didn't want to. And before they even rolled it, we start to hear some knocking on the trees nearby and we wait to see if it happens again, but it doesn't. So we just shake it off, like Tater Swift. Just kidding. We shake it off and just kind of pretend that it was just some random wood sounds. Peter eventually rolls a really terrible blunt, and he and Jason smoke it together. We continue walking and decide that we'll turn back once we reach Lake Patoka. We keep walking until we hear the knocking again. We're a little scared now because we believe that it could be somebody following us. Jason then yells for whoever it is to come out. Everybody tells him to shut the fuck up because we don't want to screw around with anybody. Especially when our only defense is Andrew's crappy handgun. So we keep walking. And now we're definitely aware that these knocking on the trees are not just random noises now as they start to get louder. Jason just keeps looking back and saying random stuff every time there's a knock. He would say, Bet you won't come out and face us. Stuff like that. We stop after we hear something in the bushes next to us. And we start to hear branches breaking as well. We stand there for about five minutes. Waiting for something awful to happen. Eventually, we decide that it could have been a raccoon. Maybe a small animal. So we keep walking slowly. Then, all of a sudden, we start to hear footsteps. Almost like there's a big dog walking around us. At this point, all of us are terrified. We start to speed walk now. As we don't want to run in case whatever it is comes out of nowhere and just jumps at us. We finally start to think like normal humans. And we decide to stop. And we all agree to go back instead. Peter starts to freak out. Saying that he doesn't want to go back. Especially not with that thing back there. I convince him that it's a better shot than staying in the woods with whatever it might be. As soon as we start to head back, that's when we hear it. A laughing sound. Laughing. But it wasn't a normal laughing sound. It was this weird hyena laughing sound. As soon as we hear this, we convince ourselves that it's just someone screwing around with us. Andrew takes his gun out, and he walks with it in front of him, and the laughing sound just continues. I kid you not, the laughing has been going on for like 30 seconds straight. It continues, and Jason gets mad and grabs a branch, and throws it to where the laughing is coming from. Then, that's when I realize that there's no more sounds. Literally, no noise in the woods. Nothing. No crickets. Birds. Anything. Jason then screams out, Leave us alone, you dick. This isn't funny anymore. 10 seconds later, we hear this screech. I'm not joking, it sounded almost like a lion mixed with an elephant. But it was a high pitched sound, and it was just really loud. I know that's a poor description, but just picture the most horrible screech you ever heard. 
that's when we just fucking run for it and as we're running they begin to leave me behind because my cardio is terrible and i'm kind of chunky i yell at them to wait but they're all scared so they just keep going i know the adrenaline is carrying them and they're hauling ass well so much for my gun protection they eventually leave me behind but what they didn't know was that i had the key to the truck i'll stop for a minute to catch my breath that's when I hear something running behind me. It still sounds like a big fucking dog. But for some reason I couldn't move. It's almost like if I was just standing there. Ready to accept that whatever it was. Was going to kill me. I just stare. And that's when I see this weird human like person. Running on all fours. Straight at me. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. This thing was so fucking fast. That's when I got shoved. I turn around and it's Andrew. He sees this thing coming as well and he has a look of fear on his face and he pulls me to run. We run for like five minutes and I have no idea how this thing didn't catch up to us. And I also don't know how my fat ass did it, but I did. We just jogged and came across Jason and Peter. We're all together now and we didn't hear a thing behind us anymore. But we were still not taking any chances. We speed walk and then just jog back. We hear the hyena laughing sound again. We start to run, but the damn woods just never seemed to end. Even though we didn't think that we were that deep in the woods, the hyena sounds turn into just a scream. Then we hear the screech again at the tail end, but this time we basically break it because we hear the screech twice and the laughing sound at the same time. That's when I realized that this thing can make those noises, or there's more than one, out there. We eventually get to a tree that was broken down, and we turned around. We saw these yellow eyes behind us, like a raccoon, or a cat's when the light reflects it. Except that we didn't even have our flashlights towards it, it was just looking at us. That's when I flashed the light at it, and we finally see. How these things look it was basically like a human but really fucking skinny the skin seemed to be stained a brown color and slimy looking almost like it was wet it had a small amount of hair on its head and on its back and around its neck its arms seemed longer than its legs that must be how it runs on all fours once again we just turn around and fucking run finally reach my truck we get in, and I spend like two minutes just looking for the keys. It wasn't actually that long, but it felt like it. I freak out because I thought that I dropped them in the woods, but I found them in my back pocket. We get in. Once the lights turn on, and the thing was there standing, it was on its hind legs, just standing there. The arms were just hanging down with these long ass fingers. It stood there as if it was analyzing what the truck was, as if it was confused. Peter then tells me, screaming, begging me to run over it, but I don't want to take the chance for it to be under our vehicle. I put it in reverse, and I keep going like that until we get to the road. The thing just kept standing there. That's when we see another one come out. The second one seemed larger, like around six feet tall, and that one let out a screech. They start to run straight at us. I know I don't have time to turn this truck around before they get to us. And I push my foot down as far as it goes. I know I was going way too fast in reverse. That I almost felt like I was going to flip over somehow. But these things were now on the road. Running on all fours. At this point we're all screaming. Scared for our lives. They eventually stop after about 30 seconds. As it's obvious they can't keep up. We still keep going in reverse for another few more minutes. And I finally turn the truck around. I then go about 90 until I get to Red Hills Road. As we're driving back, we start screaming at each other about what just happened. I end up telling my dad, and he just starts laughing. Okay buddy, sure. We can go back tomorrow. Maybe they'll still be there, right? He didn't believe us at all, but he was also a little drunk. We stayed up all night just talking about it. We were going to call the police, call someone, but then we realized that they're going to get mad at us for going into the woods. Plus, 
was going to believe four stupid ass college students with two of them who had just finished smoking. We actually do talk about it all the time. We always tell people, but nobody believes us or seems to care. After that day, we never want to go back into those woods again, or any woods for that matter. Nothing else happened after that, except that I had this nightmare not too long ago. I had woken up in my room, and in the corner, I saw the creature that we saw in the woods, and it was just doing that hyena laugh. And to my surprise, it started to speak to me, and it was saying, I'm going, going to, to get, get you. you. And it just kept repeating that over and over again. I want to say it was a nightmare or some sleep paralysis episode. But I just wanted to include that last part to see what you all think. You might not believe me, but if I can just give you some advice, don't go into any woods. My story took place several years ago when we lived on the res in Arizona. My entire family had gotten together for my mom's birthday at my grandmother's house, out in the sticks in the middle of nowhere. I didn't have any brothers or sisters, so my cousins were my siblings and I decided to spend the night with them at my grandmother's house. Her dog started barking like crazy. I was half asleep in the living room with my two cousins on the floor. As by this time we were tired from playing and being out all day. No one was getting up to check, but I don't blame them because it was pitch black outside. But I could tell that the dogs were running back and forth, chasing something. I got curious, so I turned the outside light on and stepped out the front door to see what was going on. Suddenly, something jumped from the tree onto the side of my grandmother's house, and it started crawling all around the house. It was hard to make out but it looked like a small man crawling around like a lizard. This thing was fast too, and the dogs were just going crazy. I ran into the house screaming and terrified that there was some sort of creature outside. The noises were horrible, and it sounded like there was more than one. I also heard some squeaking sounds that got real loud. My uncle came to the living room and woke everyone up and gathered all of us in one room. He put some big wall-like panels on the windows and told us under no circumstances as me and my cousins gathered together. That's when we heard them and they could be heard walking around. I looked at my cousins and one of them said that our grandma always told them that when these things happen to repeat the following words. You who walk in shadows, you who are full of deceit in the sacred place you will find no sea. Great spirits of the land, hear my plea. Guardians of the old ways, come to me. In the presence of this evil, I stand strong, and with the wisdom of the elders, I belong. I don't remember how long the sounds outside lasted, but they eventually faded, and I knocked out. When the morning came, we all went outside to check out the house. The dogs were in the tool shed and too tired to move. My uncle got a ladder and we climbed to the roof. What we saw was really shocking. There was some sort of bundle, as this is what my uncle called it. My uncle told me not to mention it to anyone in the family, especially my grandmother. She had said all her life that skinwalkers were after her. I didn't believe her, but after that night, I began to wonder if she was telling the truth. I later asked my uncle what he thought it was, and he said it was definitely a witch that had cursed our family in the old days before the treaties. He said someone in the family was a known witch and when they were killed, the elders had placed a curse on the family. My uncle then started laughing and said that no one outside of the family remembers any of that, and that's most likely a rumor anyway. Well, this scared me enough that I believe that there may be something to that story. But after that incident, I never did spend another night at my grandmother's place again.
We never spoken about this event, not even among ourselves after it happened. It was my friend Ben, Ryan, and me going camping into the woods like we used to do when we got a weekend off, or at least used to before this. In general, we try to go to new places. There was this one forest situated about two hours away from our city that we had been told about. We had been putting it off for a while because it was said to be dangerous, packed with wild animals that could attack campers pretty often. Ben, in his usual part of trying to be a badass, said that he would take a shotgun and that we would be safe. Ryan was a bit of a wimp, but he agreed. So we drove there as soon as we had a free weekend. We got there by mid-afternoon or so. After we set up our camp and the night was beginning to set in, we decided to go for a walk. I mean, you know how we as men are. We like to venture out, almost hoping we encounter something, but yet at the same time hoping we don't. Hopefully that makes sense. So we secured our stuff, and Ben took his shotgun in case any animals approached us, and we started following a small path that got deeper into the woods. Walks in the dark like this used to always relax me, but this time, I was starting to feel uneasy. Something felt weird, like a sense of danger. I mean, we are out here in the woods alone at night. After about half an hour of walking and just not finding anything of interest, we started to hear what sounded like strange noises. It sounded like footsteps of several big creatures closing in on us, but to this day, I swear I could also hear soft whispers beneath the noises. I was feeling like a corner animal. In total panic, Ryan says, What the fuck are those noises? And so he just starts running the path that we had came from, and I end up following right behind him. Ryan of course was the fastest, and Ben was behind us, and he starts screaming to keep running back to the campsite. Now, call me dumb. But I somehow lost sight of Ryan as we were running. I mean, he was running fast as fuck and maybe in one of the trails he got way ahead. I couldn't even see his flashlight in the distance. But I kept on running. I didn't care where I was going. At some point as I was running, I came across an old cabin that looked like it had suffered a fire and was boarded up. And so I knew I had ran back towards a different path. I slowed down and noticed that the door seemed half open. Then, I heard Ryan calling from inside. Terrified at first, I froze there. I was a little doubtful at first for some reason. I bolted into the cabin and closed the door. I lifted my flashlight to look around, and there was Ryan. I pointed the light to his eyes, but he didn't seem to react to it. In fact, he seemed pretty calm, which was actually strange for him, especially in the circumstance. And all he said was, let's stay here for now. In a neutral tone of voice, those things out there could be dangerous. Now, I was worried about Ben, but I remember that worst case scenario, he had a shotgun ready if anything attacked him. I took a deep breath and started looking around the room. There were a few chairs that were lying on the floor. In one corner of the room, there was a pile of sticks with a bunch of stones all around them. I then asked Ryan what the heck this place is, and he just looks at me, and all of a sudden, two loud bangs. Ben's shotgun had gone off twice. I stood there paralyzed, as every other sound in the forest also stopped. I glanced briefly at Ryan, and he was just staring at me, completely quiet. I was about to say something when something started banging on the door. Ryan quickly grabbed my shoulder and said, don't open the door. It could be one of those things. I started walking towards the door, but he insisted. Don't do it. They're going to kill us. This was really weird, but I was afraid it could be Ben, who had just shot one of the wild animals and most likely saw us come inside the cabin to shelter. I grabbed onto the metal door handle, took a deep breath, and as Ryan was still talking behind me, I opened the door. A cold chill ran down my spine. Standing there in front of me was Ryan. It didn't sink in at first. He started saying, 
I was waiting for you at the tree line and saw you come in here. So I came to hide with you instead. Did you also hear Ben's shotgun go off? I think we need to find them and just get the fuck out of here. I tried to mumble something, but at this point I didn't know what to do. I slowly turned around, pointing my flashlight all over the room. I was by myself. When the light reached the corner of the room, I realized that what I had been looking at earlier was a pile of bones and around them, forming a circle, were a bunch of skulls. They looked like human skulls too but I didn't stick around enough to really examine them. I told Ryan let's get the fuck out of here right now and we ran as fast as we could. We found Ben near the campsite and when he saw us, he became pale and didn't say a word. We got in my truck and drove the hell away from there, leaving everything behind. On the way back, there was a long silence. I asked Ben what he was shooting at and he said, some things came from the trees and they attacked me. They came up from behind, and I shot them down. Ben, what were they? And he said, it was you guys. I thought I'd kill both of you back there. After that, nobody spoke a word for the rest of the trip. After we got home, Ben just stopped talking to us, and he moved away. This was strange. Ben was one of our best friends, and we just never saw him again. When I was 19, I joined the army. This was in Singapore, so I had to serve a total of two years. I went through basic training. Everything was fine. I found out I was selected to be a senior Lee after that. So I went to school for about two months, which is in another army camp across the country. The building that we were staying in was a few decades old, but not too bad. It actually looked clean enough. Anyways, there were a lot of facilities, dorms for sleeping in, toilets, showers, and stuff like that. There was a small corner in the ground floor for people to smoke as well. The first few weeks were very uneventful. We slept in single beds, six in a row facing each other. But from the third week on, things began to happen. Small things, but it was hard to ignore them. I slept in a bed that was in the middle of the bunk and I was facing the open windows. Our bunk was on the fourth floor, and there was a tree outside, so I never got super bright. So for some nights, I would lie down and go to sleep, but just before drifting off to sleep, I would feel my bed almost shake. It was just enough to wake me up, but there was nothing when I woke up, or there would be a random noise, a fracture sound, to wake me up. Imagine someone, saying something unintelligible to you out of the blue. I just brushed it off as me being too tired, but as it continued to happen every other day, it was getting hard to ignore. Also, it meant that I was sleeping poorly. I would later find out that I wasn't the only one, but everyone had their own experience. People just didn't want to share such things at first. I'm gonna list some of the more major happenings. The first one, I woke up in the dark. I looked at my watch and it was around 1 a.m. I was about to go back to sleep, but then I heard two people talking. I was thinking it was my fellow bunkmates. I sat up to have a better look. There was some faint moonlight coming in from outside, so I could make out the different shapes. Everyone that I saw was clearly asleep in their beds. The muttering of the two voices went on. The more I tried to listen to what they were saying, the more I just couldn't understand it. They weren't speaking English or any other foreign language that I knew. It was a bunch of gibberish noises, but there were two distinct ones. Terrified, I just slipped back down into my bed. The second thing happened on another night. I woke up again, but this time around 11.30. The room was quiet. Everyone was sleeping. Then I heard the sound of shuffling the sound of flip-flops on bare concrete floor. It clearly originated from the room, but nobody was walking. The sound traveled from one end of the room to the other. It was exactly as somebody was pacing the room, but I couldn't see them. When it reached the end of the room, there would be a short pause. Then it would start coming back again in the other direction. 
determined to know that it wasn't just me. I rolled down to the side and reached across to tug my friend, who was sleeping on his bed. He was annoyed and surprised to be woken up naturally, but I did whisper to him, Do you hear those noises? He didn't understand what I was talking about at first, but by the very faint light, I saw his eyes widen in the dark. He could hear it too. I then told him, Who is that? And he said, I don't know. There doesn't seem to be anybody. After a while, he shook his head and put his finger up to his mouth, telling me to be quiet. He turned around and wrapped his blanket over him. It was clear that he didn't want to think too much about it. The other thing that happened was when my bed was shaking. Another small miscellaneous occurrence is that all these minor things continue every other day. The timing of them gradually increased over the next few weeks. One time, there was a loud sound that took everyone by surprise. We were chatting and laughing normally, and suddenly, it came and shut everyone up. It was the sound of metal panes slamming shut, but nothing was moving. The windows were fine. Another time, the door to the room started to rattle, as if somebody was trying to open it from the other side. Thinking it was our sergeants playing a prank on us, we opened the door, but we were just looking down an empty hall. We were only greeted by a tunnel of darkness. There would also be loud stomping sounds coming from above. Even though the floor above us was totally locked off and empty at that time, there started to be gossip of course. Bringing up the issue to our sergeants was either met with denial or deflection, but it was clear from their eyes we weren't the first batch of trainees to experience something, and I wasn't the only one affected in my bunk. A few guys had it worse. People started moving out to sleep in spare beds and other rooms, or even with other trainee batches, even though it wasn't allowed. I continued to stay, thinking that I could live with it, if only a few more weeks until I graduated. I woke up in the middle of the night. I wanted to reach out to check the time, but I couldn't move. I was sleeping on my side, and there was an empty space on my bed. I realized I was having sleep paralysis, so I didn't panic. I couldn't move, but I could see the room just fine. I could see everybody was sleeping, the windows were open, the leaves of the trees were moving. And so I told myself to just breathe and maybe I could wake up naturally. Over the next few minutes, I was able to regain my movements and actually wake up to check the time. And as I was doing this, sitting up in my bed, I see something at the corner of my eye. Something that shouldn't be there. Something moved in the far corner. I tried squinting at it. And I saw something tall. Very skinny and black. It looked almost exactly like a stick figure that a kid would draw with a marker. It would almost be comical if it weren't so terrifying. And if you don't believe me, I would understand. It started to move across the room, striding slowly in a broken and stiff way like a bad animation that was missing keyframes. It walked or limped across the room. My fear was starting to build up. I tried to comprehend what I was looking at. I wanted to say something, to do something, but I couldn't. Reaching my bed, it turned around to look at me. The face was round and didn't have any facial features, except for two dots for eyes and a long white mouth that pulled up into a smile. It sat down in the empty space on my bed and reached out with one of its arms. It had too many fingers. I couldn't even count them. They were dried, wrinkly fingers and reached down and touched the soles of my bare feet. I could feel each finger. With a massive effort, I broke out of whatever spell this thing had me under. I started screaming and I saw that this thing looked angry. And with all the commotion of people getting up and turning on the lights, I saw it laugh, and then, there was nothing. At this point I was sweating, I know what I saw, and I could still feel the physical sensation of it. I moved out to another bunk the next day. I had enough. My mental health was suffering. Out of the 12 of us that were there, I was the fifth guy to move. There was only three weeks left in our training, but I didn't want to sleep there anymore. I couldn't. This incident legit turned me from half a skeptic into 
This creepy ass shit is way too much for me. I'm getting the fuck out of here. It can't be rationalized. I just don't want to be around some creepy ass shit again. It's very mentally draining on your body. Especially to have physical training in the day. And then you can't even get a good night's sleep later on. I even started to doubt my judgment of reality. It's totally not fun at all. Especially when you encounter such things like this in real life. I have only shared this with a few people and still when I think about it, it just freaks me out. And growing up in a small town exploring it in the hills was the thing to do. This incident took place at the north end of Ruby Valley in Elko County, Nevada. Someday I will play around on Google Maps to try to find this place. But it's slightly on the north road of Highway 93 that goes into the Ruby Valley. I have always liked checking out old mine shafts and ghost towns. That stuff really intrigues me. At the Burger Bar in Wells, Nevada, where I am from and where I grew up, they had these old turn of the century maps under glass on the tables. And one of them showed several ghost towns just north of Ruby Valley. So I figured I would go check them out, as I had not been in the area very often. I gassed up my 72 Dodge pickup and grabbed my HK91 and I set out. I had found some old foundations in the lower country and started heading into the mountains themselves and I started finding some old abandoned mine shafts. It was pretty cool, to be honest. So I kept going up. I took this old road that was no more than an overgrown cattle path at this point in history. And that came upon a tree blocking the road. It was an old pine, about two feet in diameter, and it was blocking the road. After this tree in the road, the road continued straight for about 200 yards and then it hooked right before coming back again 180 degrees. I parked my truck in front of the tree and I started to set out on foot. I grabbed my HK with one 20 round magazine in the rifle and I put a 20 round mag in my back left pocket. I always had a rifle with me as I have encountered a lot of mountain lions and mine shafts before and just generally I like to shoot targets and stuff. So I get up on the ridge lines and I'm shooting at this big boulder from a couple hundred yards away. As soon as I climbed down over the fallen tree, I had this really creepy feeling as if somebody was watching me. I continue on for 200 yards to the point where the road started curving right and gaining elevation. And when it did, it was going towards this cabin that was up the hill. At this point, I realized that not only did I feel like somebody was watching me, it was also really quiet. This was in June or so. School had just got out. Everywhere you went, you could hear those old cicadas, but not out here. It seemed like as soon as I crossed the fallen tree, the mountains became silent. No bugs or birds, nothing. Just deafening silence. As I came up to the turn, there was this big rock. The thing had to be about 15 feet in diameter. You could tell that it used to be on the road, but because of years of erosion and all that stuff, it had slid down just slightly off the road. It seemed to be red limestone, I think, or something like that. It stood out since they are not quite that common in this area. I looked at the rock, and you could tell that there were some carvings in it at some point in time. But again, because of weathering, whatever was carved in it had been worn off. I kept walking up the road. I was really creeped out, but I really wanted to check out that old cabin up there, as it was pretty obvious that no one had been there in a long, long time. At this point, I was maybe three hours off road to get to this point. Eventually, I did get up to the cabin. As far as abandoned houses and cabins in Nevada go, this one was actually in pretty good shape. All of the glass on the windows was still intact, and there was some evidence of curtains behind the windows. By this point, there was something in the back of my mind telling me that I should keep on going. I went into the cabin, and that's where I started to get the feeling that something was off again. Most cabins you find out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada 
are empty. There's nothing really left in them. Maybe a bit of broken chairs and couches and stuff. But this one was completely furnished. Time had taken its toll, but everything was still there. What was left of an old mattress and some bedding was still there as well. There were plates and other cookware throughout the house, along with these tattered clothing and personal artifacts such as a chest and faded pictures. And what really creeped me out was at the dinner table. It was still set for people, dinner plates, glasses, and silverware. This was the first cabin that I have ever found that was in this condition. It was as if whoever resided here had just got up and left and chose to leave everything behind. I felt like I shouldn't be in the cabin, and I went outside to see if I could find a mine shaft or anything else. Once I was out the door, I decided to chamber around into my HK. The sound of me rocking around echoed throughout the canyon and broke the eerie silence. As little of a thing as it was, this actually helped calm my nerves down a bit. And now, directly behind the cabin, was a well. It was still intact. As I got closer, it sounded like there was some noise coming from it, like a slight breeze rustling through it or something. When I got about 30 feet of this, I started to smell something, and it smelled pretty bad, putrid almost, and I figured there was definitely some animal that had died in the well. The smell of something decaying was heavy in the air with this other scent that I couldn't identify that tore my nostrils. I didn't want to get any closer to the well, and I started leaning towards the left where I could see the opening to a mine shaft up on the hill. The closer I got to it, I could feel the breeze coming out of it. This is not really uncommon if you explore mine shafts before, as the breeze could be coming in from another opening in the mine, but the thing was, it was perfectly calm. As far as I could see, there were no trees moving or any signs of the wind. The closer I got to the opening of the mine shaft, the more of a feeling of that dread and being watched I got. I got within 15 feet of the shaft when the smell hit me again. That same smell of decay, but it was much stronger than the well. Right then, all of my spidey senses started going off. I knew it was time to get out of there. I started turning left to book it out of there when I saw a dark shadow moving in the opening of the mine shaft. Whatever it was, it appeared to be crouched down to fit into the mine shaft, as most that I have seen are about 8 to 10 foot ceilings. At first I thought it was a mountain lion, but then I remember how big these mine shafts were, my mind raised trying to process and think of what the hell this was. It was too big to be a black bear, which are also rare in northeastern Nevada. I nearly froze with panic and it slowly kept coming towards the opening of the mine shaft. It was maybe within 10 feet of the opening, and the light was starting to show just whatever this was. It was covered, from head to toe, in grayish brown fur. Then, it screamed at me. It was unlike anything I ever heard in my entire life. My ears were ringing. I flipped into panic mode and I did what any good person would do. I started shooting at it. I pulled up my HK, placed the front blade on what appeared to be its center of mass, and ripped off five rounds as fast as I could. If you ever shot a big game with a large caliber rifle, you know the sound when you connect with something. I had four solid hits and one round that went just a little too high. Then it made the scream even louder than it had before in pain. At this time, I started hearing more and separate screams coming from all over the well and from the hills above the mine shaft. That's when I started running down the hill as fast as I could, and the tree line above the road, about 75 to 125 yards. I could see fast movement. The rocks were tumbling down the hill, and there were several other screams from the mine shaft. Whatever it was, I had definitely connected, and it was hurting. But whatever was up in the tree line, they were running from tree to tree on all fours, getting closer to me. As I ran towards the rock, I was shooting in the general vicinity of the movement on top of the hill. By the time I got to the limestone rock, I had expended a 20 round mag. I ripped it out and put my spare mag in and chamber around. 
and I started running towards the fallen tree, about 200 yards away by now. I kept looking back, and whatever they were, they were staying in the trees. I could make out their masses and fur, but they wouldn't stay in the open. I got back to the fallen tree, and I fell in the dirt trying to jump over it. I got up off my ass, and I fired between 12 and 15 rounds at the closest movement, which was about 50 yards away from me now. I heard a few rounds connect, and I started screaming. Between the screaming and the gunshots, my ears were damn near death. I opened the door of my truck and I started the fucking thing as fast as I could. Backing up to turn around, I damn near put my truck down in the canyon, and as I started to leave on the road that I had came in, that's when I finally got to look at one of them. It was crouched over with its front feet on the tree. It was covering head to toe in grayish brownish fur and had long slender fingers with claws tipping them off. The back of it was hunched over and the face was slender, almost looking like that of a badger but with more sunken eyes. It was shaking its head back and forth and it sounded like he was attempting to yell at me again or speak or something. It was the scariest scream ever. But with the noise of my truck, I could not make out just what the hell it was, or what the hell it was trying to do, or say. I averaged about 50 to 60 miles per hour on a shitty dirt road that I had done 15 on the way up, but I didn't slow down until I got back to the pavement. By now, I was so shaken that I had to stop and collect myself. I got back to town, and I was in a bit of shock. My dad was basically an expert in the Ruby Mountains for about 20 years. He asked me how my trip went. He could tell I was startled and ask where I had been. I told him that I had been north of Ruby Valley and he got quiet and asked if I had seen a cabin with a fallen tree over the road. I told him yes. He looked me in the eyes and told me that it's somewhere that I should never, ever go again, especially by myself. He wouldn't speak about it after that and to honor that, I have never been back there. It's part of the reason why I live in the west side of Nevada now. But in the back of my mind, there was something telling me that I should go back. And maybe one day, I will go back. This was back in 2001, before camera phones. I was too broke to afford a digital camera. So I want to go back with the camera. Maybe a GoPro on my helmet. And with several friends that have rifles. Just something about there even with the shit that I experience is actually drawing me back. One day I will go back. I'll draw a sketch. My drawing skills are really shitty. So this is just going to be a rough sketch. And I did try researching it. But this was a few years ago. I was asking some old timers and one of them told me a story about the rubies. I'll say it really quickly. During the 40s and 50s. The U.S. Army was operating out of the Wendover Air Base. Every now and then, during fucked up weather, a B-25, B-17, or a B-29 would smack the rubies because of poor visibility. Some of the local ranchers got recruited to help the military go up to a crash site during the winter to recover the bodies. The rancher that I was talking to told me that it took them around three days to get up to where this crash was. He said that when they got to the wreckage, all of the crew members were laid out side by side, next to each other, in a clearing in the wreckage. Many of them were missing arms and legs, and it was obvious that all of them died on impact somehow. Keep in mind that this was about 10,000 feet above sea level, and the bodies were laying next to each other. Did you know that the flute was a traditional instrument that the natives first used when they first settled in? It's said that the skinwalker uses the flute to communicate with the spirits in other planes or dimensions. I was working on a ranch in Chinle one summer near Canyon de Chelly. It was a fairly big spread, a couple hundred acres at least. We had been having problems with coyotes getting into the sheep pens at night. The guy that I was working for, Dwayne, sent me and his middle son 
He was about 17, out to make sure the gate on the corral at the southern end of the property was closed. The younger boy, he was maybe 11, wanted to come with us as well, so we let him jump in the back of the jeep. It was after dark. The drive out there was a good 10 or 15 minutes. Dwayne's kid was behind the wheel. I was sitting in the passenger seat, my head back and my eyes half closed, just enjoying the cool night air and the quietness. When we got there, Dwayne's kid, his name was Jay, sent his little brother, Aaron, out to check the gate. It was only 20 or so yards off the road and to the far side of some post with chicken wire. My eyes were still kind of closed when I heard some whistling, but it wasn't like a person. It was more like the sound of a flute, the reed kind with the holes punched through it. It was a simple tune, but it was deep. That's when out of nowhere, Jay starts yelling for Aaron to get back in the Jeep. And it's like he's not kidding. Just the way he was yelling, basically screaming at him, caused me to jump up and it had my heart racing as if something bad was about to happen. He kept asking me, his voice in near panic, do you hear that? Uh, sounds like some kind of flu, I said. Just at that moment, Aaron launches himself into the back of the jeep, his eyes wide open and looking as if he is ready to cry. Jay turns the key and practically before the engine turns on, he's got his weight on the gas pedal like he's afraid it's going to push back. The wheel starts spinning, Dirt and pebbles are flying all over the place. No sooner does Jay get us in motion when the sound of this flute is right there as if whoever is playing it is just there in the dark. But I couldn't see a damn thing. As soon as we get back to the ranch house, the two boys run in and tell Dwayne what happened. The next day he goes into the settlement and comes back with a medicine man. The old guy spends more than half the day going around and blessing every part of the ranch. When he leaves, he tells us to be careful and to not go out alone at night. He said he is sure that there's a skinwalker going around. This doesn't have any off the charts action like some stories you might hear, but this is something that did make me reconsider living in the remote areas. I went camping with two of my buddies about seven years back. We were backpacking out in the deep woods of Montana. Every day we would wake up, hike until about noon, and then find a place to camp for the night and spend the rest of the daylight hours fishing or shooting cans with a BB gun. All of us actually had real guns, but as you know, ammo isn't cheap and we wanted them only for emergencies. We had a great first few days. On the fourth day, we must have been about 50 miles from the nearest road. We decided that this would be as far as we go, and tomorrow we would head back the way we came. We were pretty high up on a hill at this point, and we had a lovely view of the landscape. We found what seemed to be the concrete foundation of a long since demolished fire watch station, and decided that it would be the perfect place to camp. We made a fire, and then we went to sleep. It was still pretty early, but we were all tired as hell. Later that night, I woke up to go pee. I walked out to the edge of the concrete platform and it was basically pitch black outside. The stars were beautiful though. I remember pointing my flashlight down the hill the way we came because I didn't want to point it at the tents and wake up my friends. The flashlight was pretty weak. One of those real heavy ones with a dark yellow light that only lights up about 30 feet in front of you. I could barely make out what I thought was a deer moving across the path that we took up the hill but it was too far for my flashlight to really hit it and there were about a dozen trees in the way so I only saw a few flashes of it. After a few seconds I saw that it was actually not a deer. It was a person and I started to freak out because I assumed it was a ranger that was about to give us hell for having a fire without a permit. Every time I looked back this person was a couple feet closer to me and I could hear them taking slow steps whenever I looked down, attempting to control my stream. I didn't realize it at this time how strange it would be for a ranger to be wandering around here without a flashlight at 2 in the morning. 
but I was tired. I could only still barely make out the rough shape of him within the darkness with my really crappy flashlight. But I finished up my business and then pointed the flashlight back at the person. He wasn't moving towards us anymore. I yelled out to them and asked if they needed something, but I got no response. At this point, my buddies were awake and they came out of their tents to see what was going on. One of them had a much more powerful flashlight than I did and he pointed it to where I was pointing mine. It lit up the person and we could see him pretty clearly now. He was tall, but fairly lanky, and about six and a half feet tall. And something was indeed wrong with this person. They had sideways facial features. They weren't bloody or anything. It's not like he was attacked by a bear and had just rearranged his face. But his eyes were just sideways, and the mouth was also sideways. He was staring directly at us and starting to smile pretty hard even though I'm not sure if I would actually consider it smiling because it basically was just baring its teeth at us and maintaining eye contact. It was still pretty far away, maybe about 100 feet, but we could still see its face pretty clearly. Its eyes were wide, open enough for us to see the whites. We were all pretty shocked obviously and one of my buddies pointed his gun at him. As soon as this thing saw the gun, it just sort of coughed or gurgled. It sounded kind of like when someone is choking. It turned around but kept looking at us over its shoulder as it moved back the way it came from. It wasn't making any sort of effort to stay hidden. And with the bright light from my buddy, we watched it walk off into the woods for about 10 minutes until we couldn't see it anymore. All of us were freaking out and we quickly packed up our camp and let the fire die down. But that was the scariest part to be honest. Not seeing this thing first but packing up the camp basically in the dark. Because we couldn't hold our flashlights and look at the woods around us. In the meantime, we heard plenty of noises. And the entire time we felt like this thing was going to sprint out of the darkness. But it never did. We had our rifles out until daylight. Then we hiked faster than I ever hiked. And we got out of the woods. We hiked so fast that we were out by noon. We threw our stuff into the truck and drove 90 miles per hour checking the mirrors every 10 seconds. We never saw that thing again. Once we were back in town, we all recounted exactly what we had all seen to each other. And our descriptions of this thing's face were all exactly the same. Very wide eyes, sideways features. It never attacked us. The woods didn't fall silent. This thing didn't smell like its flesh was rotting. It was just strange. Bizarre. It looked wrong, and it also moved wrong. And the scariest part was when we couldn't see it at all because we didn't know if it was going to be right next to us. And we didn't need to fire any warning shots, even though we were all thinking about doing it. As soon as it saw the gun, it started backing away. Maybe other people or other campers had fired at it before and it understood what it was. But that's also scary because that means it's actually quite intelligent. We were trying for hours to rationalize it, but none of us could really figure out why somebody would be out in the middle of the woods with no flashlight or backpack, stalking some random hikers in the middle of the night. None of us think that it was a human, but we also got no explanation. It's basically a campfire story for us at this point. We still go camping here and there, and I had some other weird stuff happen as well. But this is just about this specific case. But nowadays we stick to actual campsites. And we invite more friends than before. Backpacking alone is out of the question for me. English is not my first language. But I want to tell you about my encounter with the goat walker. I was camping in North Minnesota. It was early winter, which is tame in comparison to my home. I'm with my stepbrother, my stepfather, and Alaska. Alaska is an old dog that I've been having since I was just five years old. The day is normal. Alaska is quiet. My stepbrother is loud, and we go fishing. We start to fire and cook. At some point during this, I realize that we don't have any water. 
My stepfather tells me to go get some water, that there are some wells a mile or two down the trail. So my stepbrother, myself, and my dog Alaska are walking down the trail in the dark. We're far from any town, so the night is very dark, but the sky is looking really beautiful. So anyways, my stepbrother is spoiled. We're about 100 meters from the camp, and he starts saying that he's really tired. So I tell him to just go back. He takes the flashlight and storms off. From here, it's just me and Alaska, old friends from home. A few minutes as we continue walking, we start to hear this weird noise. We think it's an animal. It's not abnormal hearing animals in North Minnesota, obviously, but it seemed to be the wrong animal for these woods. It sounded like there was gravel scraping, and my dog is very nervous, which is pretty strange. My dog is strong-minded, so I get kind of worried too. He doesn't always act like this, as he starts to yip and snarl. Now I figure this must be a weird animal because the dog knows animals well and also knows their smells. We're also outdoors a lot, so this makes me a little bit more bothered. The rest of the walk is pretty silent, but Alaska keeps stopping and looking back down the trail. I begin to think that my stepbrother is playing tricks on us, but I'm too impatient to play around. So I finally get to the well, and I'm pumping the old lever, and it's making that creaking sound that they do. But then, in the woods I hear a sound like an injured animal. I'm very uneasy now. My dog is now hiding behind me, and this dog is normally super brave, and likes to stand in front and guard me. But this time Alaska is too afraid. So I quickly fill up the jugs and I'm ready to go back. It's very hard to see in the dark because my stepbrother took the flashlight. So all I can use is the light from the sky. It's also very difficult to carry that many jugs of water with only so many hands. As I'm walking, Alaska begins to snarl and whine all over again. But this time, I can now see a figure on the trail ahead. It's not moving. It's just staring into the woods. It's obviously human, but I know Alaska would be eager to meet a stranger. It loves people, so I cough pretty loud so that the figure can hear. And that's when this person speaks. Oh, you were passing by me earlier, and I didn't see or hear anyone. I stand there for a second, weary because again, I'm sure there was nobody on the trail. I can hear my dog breathing. Then, this weird sound comes from the man. I know this wasn't smart of me, but I decide to ask him where he's staying. And he says, Oh, I have a tent. It's only a couple of sites from yours. I stand there again, not sure what to say. Then the water sloshes around in the jugs, and the man offers help to carry them. I actually agree, but as he starts walking over to me, there's another weird noise. And Alaska starts barking at this person when he comes over and takes the jug. He's really rough with it. And I also notice that he's all dirty. Like his hands look like he was digging in the mud or something. But I do say thank you. And he says, oh, not a problem. And that he's always eager to give help. My dog on the other hand is now standing on the other side of me, sniffing the air. And then I notice that it kind of smells like a farm. I don't want to be rude, so I don't ask questions. And I can actually see the campfire light through the trees, so I know we're not that far away. But as we're walking, there's a sudden feeling of anxiety that's overtaking me. I have this desire to tell the man that he doesn't have to come all the way back to camp, and I don't know why I'm having this issue. I never have any problems talking with my family, my boss, or girls but I can't bring myself to look sideways at this man. But I have the feeling that something is insanely wrong with him. The fire was close enough now to throw a shadow, but I can't see anybody's face, and there's no talking. There's only sound from the fire. I still have this overwhelming fear. It's like the metal from the water, and then the farm smell. It's burning my nostrils. And then I realize that it reminds me of a time when my dad cut himself in the big barn. This, the smell of it all, and that much blood. I'm still afraid of blood, and I'm just very ill from that memory. 
that's when I finally turn to look at the man and I see that his eyes are wide all over. I'm taken aback as I yell and then there's the animal sound again and my dog barks. The man says, why are you screaming? And he sounds actually afraid. And that's when I realize that he's actually blind. I confess and say that I don't think that he's actually blind. And he just gives this weird creepy laugh and says not to worry about it. And then I hear the animal sound again. But by now, we're in full firelight. And it keeps looking like there's a weird animal just standing behind the man. It's like when you see those videos where there's a spirit that's attached to a person. And it looks like it's almost inside of them or something. And that's when I say, what's that behind you? And he says, oh, don't worry about that. And that's when I realize that there's something really weird going on. The man then laughs to break the silence and he hands me the water jug. And that's when he says that he has to go and just doesn't say anything else. And he kind of hobbles off with this weird gate off into the woods. A few minutes later, my stepfather and my stepbrother come back from the trees as they had both gone to use the bathroom. That's the end of my story. I did the best that I could. I thought it was worth it. I know the English was very, very bad in it. And I most likely messed up on some words. So I tried to fix it the best I could to get the point across. So I hope you still enjoyed it. I'm not sure who this man was, or even if he was a man. Maybe he was the devil helping me out, maybe. I'm not sure, but I know that image of his face still haunts me to this day. So this is not that scary or weird as some other stuff that you might see or hear. But it happened back around in 2010 when I went to Montana with my dad. I think I was about 13 or 14 around there. Anyways, this is some crazy stuff that happened to me. So we were in the middle of the Rocky Mountains in Montana to be exact. I was with my dad on a trip cross country. We stopped in the national park for a few days. It was a random small town, so we park at this local super cool campground that has a lake nearby where I can go jump off the rocks and into the lake. I know it's going to sound strange, and now that I think about it, it really was bad of my dad to do this. He would leave me here while he went to the bar. I mean, I was pretty mature, I want to say, at that age, but still. Who leaves their son alone while they go get their fix right so while i'm swimming and playing around in the lake this dude i know don't talk to strangers but i mean i wasn't a little kid no more but there was this older guy he looked native american and he looked to be about 60 or 70 and he walks up to me and he just tells me that there are things in this area that belong to the blackfoot tribe Something about the guardians of these lands. He spoke of artifacts left behind by his ancestors. Relics about legends. He then looked at me in the eyes. And in a stern tone. Said. Do not disturb these sacred objects. If you see them. Don't pick them up. And do not touch them. There are beads on the ground that show the history. Necklaces with the spirits of our ancestors shoes that walk the roads that we now take and drawings that capture the history of us each item is a thread of blackfoot culture respect it and honor it and that was it he simply walked away yeah very weird i know so my dad eventually came back a bit drunk but to be honest that's when he was more friendly so as the days went by we went hiking a bit and as we were walking, I came across some black stones that were sticking out of the ground a bit. I picked a few of them up because they looked very shiny and polished. I mean, where else do you see totally black mini rocks? Pebbles almost, right? Anyways, yeah, I fucked up, but let me finish telling you what happened. We got back to the campground and went back inside the RV to sleep. Now at night, 
is when the crazy shit started happening. As I was in bed, I heard this sound. It was like this crying that could be heard from the campground outside, but it didn't sound human whatsoever. It sounded like, I don't know, I can't even describe it. The kind of sounds that make the hair on your neck stand up. I'm not sure what to do. But I get even more scared when I hear footsteps walking up to the RV. I don't quite remember, but whoever is outside is breathing really heavy. It kind of sounds like a bear. Being curious and scared, I look out the window, but I don't see anything. But I know there's somebody outside because you can hear them walking. I can hear them breathing, but there's nothing out there. I end up going back to bed and eventually fall asleep. But the next morning when I wake up, we find out that a fisherman has been found dead around the lake, which is the exact lake we were staying at. I have no idea how he died, but I remember the noises from last night and I couldn't help but put two and two together. My dad then drove into town outside of this park. We were getting ready to head through the Midwest and we ended up stopping at this Native American museum. As we walk inside, I noticed it was run by this really old woman. We explored around a bit and my dad told me to keep my hands inside my pockets at all times. At some point, my dad walks up to the counter to purchase some souvenirs. As I'm looking around, I take my hands out of my pockets and one of the black rocks I collected while hiking drops out. This woman sees this and I kid you not, she completely loses her mind. She tells me that I should never pick those up again and that I don't know what I'm doing, that I have brought a curse upon myself. So me and my dad just look at her crazy and we're both a little freaked out. So we just kind of walk out. By this point, we're thinking that the whole town is just full of weird people as my dad continues driving further out. Later on that evening, we stop at a diner. As we walk in, that's when I notice him. That same native man that had talked to me at the lake. He was just standing in the corner of the diner, just staring, creepy as hell. At some point between us walking in and getting our meal, he disappears. Now there was no back door to this diner and he was gonna have to walk by us in order for him to get out. I don't know if it's related to all the creepy shit that's going on, but later on that night, when we're sleeping in the RV again, I don't hear anything no more as we're pretty much further out from the national park and that creepy ass town. I noticed and remember that I start having these weird dreams, dreams that I can't comprehend. But I know it's about a woman that is yelling at me, telling me that I shouldn't have disturbed them. I wake up, I mind you, we're so far away from the park now. I know we're like hours basically, but that's when I hear them again. Those crying sounds, they're back. This time, when I hear those terrible noises outside, the footsteps and the heavy breathing, I look outside the window and I see this thing just staring at me. I can only describe it as everything demonic. Everything about it was just wrong and just felt very evil. I closed the blinds and I lay there sleepless from that night on. I would have gone to wake up my father, but I know he would have told me to stop being a little wuss and go back to bed. I didn't sleep at all that night. As I'm laying there in bed underneath my covers, trying to ignore all the sounds outside. I start hearing taps on my window. I'm not sure what else happened as I know I eventually fell asleep. But the next morning, we finally get out of Montana. And that's when I notice that the dreams finally stop. No sounds. No dreams. No more weird people. Nothing. However, recently, I went back to Montana with my uncle about a year ago. And I kid you not, the exact same thing starts up again every night. The crying, the wailing, the sounds. I didn't see anything this time though, but still, the same dreams about this woman yelling at me. I did try to go back to the museum to find the lady I saw the first time around, but apparently, she was dead. Now, I have no idea where the guy was. The guy that gave me the warning at the lake. 
Even after I went to the diner, he wasn't there. So I ended up talking to one of the workers at the diner. And when I asked him about that guy, his eyes grew wide and said, Those who see him means that they who shall not be named are near. Creepy as fuck, right? Well, to follow up, he said that I need to leave Montana and get a full cleansing and to never pick up anything from the woods again. We did leave Montana and everything stopped again. I never did go get that cleansing, but I would advise if you go hiking, camping, backpacking, or whatever in the woods, never touch or pick anything you find. I'm from the First Nations from Canada. On the res, traditional beliefs and legends of the paranormal are still a big part of our community. The paranormal is part of life. We know there's a spirit world, and we know that sometimes these things can come over to our side and maybe even live among us. Anyways, here's the story. It was around the fall of 2011. I was 16 years old and I was living in the city near the rest with my mom. Every weekend, we would go back home to the rest to see my dad and my little brother. On Friday, during the drive back home, I got a text from a friend of mine. There was a party that night, and she wanted to know when I would be home so that she could come pick me up. I gave her a time, and she told me she would swing by. My mom and I get home, and as soon as we step inside the house, we see my dad and my cousin sitting at the kitchen table, drinking some beers. They're actually both cops on the res, and beers on a Friday evening means that they had a tough week at work. Normally, the toughest cases to deal with are child abuse, and sometimes other darker things, so a part of me feels sad upon seeing them. They both look very tired and drained, but they're happy to see us. We say our greetings, catch up a little, and my dad then starts asking me if I have any plans. I mention the party, and I tell him where it's gonna be. He and my cousin share a weird look. He says, I don't know if we should say it, while looking at my dad. He laughed, and they decided that I should most likely know what's been going on, since I'll be going to a house that's pretty deep in the woods later that evening. They start with the first strange call that they got on Monday night. An older woman called saying that there were people outside of her house, knocking on all of her windows. But she said that she couldn't see anybody, but there must have been at least three people judging by all the different locations of the knocking. They arrive at the woman's home, inspect all around the house, and even check the woods, but nothing comes up. They tell her that's most likely just some teenagers playing tricks on her, and that there isn't much else they can do besides patrol around the area in case they come back. On Wednesday night, the same woman calls again with the same issue. She said people were knocking on all her windows again. It had rained that day, and there was mud and dirt all around this woman's home. So they figure at the very least they'll find footprints, but they couldn't find anything. This is when I started feeling like something was very off because there were huge patches of mud everywhere. They thought maybe the woman was just lying for attention. But they told her the same thing they told her a few nights ago. By Thursday night, even though everyone on the rest was talking, it turns out that this woman wasn't the only one experiencing the knocking. She was just the only one to call the police. People were linking it to supernatural causes. But my dad was still sure it was just a group of teens pranking people. But then they got another call from the same woman for the same reason. They rushed over there and were met with the same situation. Except this time, the woman's neighbor walked over looking pale as a ghost. He said, is this about the knocking? He was looking very shaky. And they said, did you see something? He nodded and said, you guys are gonna think that I'm crazy. He goes on to explain that he just stepped outside for a cigarette on his front porch when he heard the knocking. He looked around and saw something by the old woman's house. There was a black figure standing outside her window. 
looking inside of her home. He said it looked like a person, but completely made out of shadow. And he could tell it was solid, but there were no features on it. He stared at it completely in shock and watched as the thing knocked a couple of times and then darted around the house, knocking on every single window. He said it moved too fast to be a human. He said it went around the house a few times. Then it ran across the road into the tree line, specifically behind one tree, as though it was hiding. The man was frozen, but he couldn't look away. The black shadow then leaned out from behind the tree and now stared directly at him with yellow eyes that reflect the light like those of a cat. And then it smiled, showing small pointed teeth. The guy then said, fucking shit in my pants. He tried a joke, but his voice was very much still in shock. My dad didn't know what to make of this, but after checking the old woman and finding her alright, even though she was shaken, he told them they would keep an eye on things, and just to put it out of their minds, try not to think about it. So jumping ahead, till Friday, by this point, everyone's got their own story. In addition to numerous people experiencing the same knocking, there were also quite a few more sightings, and everyone described the thing exactly the same way. To my dad, one woman was taking her trash bin to the road when she thought she saw someone from the corner of her eye standing near the trees. As she walked back up the driveway to her home, she felt like somebody was watching her. Right before she was about to open the door to go back inside, she looked back and saw the two reflective yellow eyes watching her from the trees. She then said that they were about five feet off the ground. Another couple was driving at night and they saw a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. As they got closer, they slowed down and it turned around to face them. They saw the figure had the same reflective yellow eyes and the sharp pointed teeth as it smiled at them. They stopped the car, too afraid to get any closer to it until they decided they should just speed past it. The road was very narrow and the figure was only a few feet away as they drove by it. They said it was maintaining eye contact with them the whole time. My father then asked me if I was still planning on going. What a coincidence. My friends were already pulling into the driveway just as he had finished. So I gave my family hugs and kisses and said goodbye. They told me to be careful, but I wasn't too concerned. Even though a common belief among us native people is that negative energy attracts negative energy. So an evil spirit will be drawn to people with unresolved issues. But if you're someone who is spiritual, self-aware, and basically a good person, that itself can protect you. So I get to the party, and within 20 minutes, the conversation started about all the paranormal experiences that people have been having. I'm really curious about what everyone has to say, because they all have stories that I haven't heard yet. But my friend couldn't hold her alcohol very well. We were 16, after all, and she was crying. And I was trying to make her feel better while listening to everyone's stories. One of the people at the party was related to the smoking man that my father first talked about. The one who first described the shadow thing that darted into the trees. This person told us that the experience shook the smoking man up so much that he had to get his entire home smudged. Smudging is something our people do when we're looking for extra protection against the paranormal. This man also went to visit a few elders around the community, asking for advice, or if they knew what the hell was going on. It's commonly said on the res that paranormal experiences don't happen as often as they used to. If you talk to the elders, they have endless stories, and even more advice about how to protect yourself compared to younger generations. Anyways, the man had gone to visit some of the elders, and one of them had explained that the shadow thing that everyone was seeing was evidence that somebody had done a forbidden shaking tent ceremony. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up more in detail. But it's basically 
and I'm going to generalize here, sort of like a Ouija board session, but it takes place inside of a tent. People stand around the tent while the medicine man goes inside and starts to ask questions. The tent begins to shake and you can hear the voices of spirits coming through. I have never personally been to a shaking tent ceremony because we haven't had a good enough reason to make one. Our ancestors used them when they were starving and in the dead of winter and needed to know where the nearest food source was. My mom's been to one and her stories are crazy. She described multiple voices, men and women, all speaking the native tongue. She said they were very upset that the people were doing a shaking tent ceremony since they weren't yet on the verge of death. The people tried to explain that they were only doing the ceremony to prove that it was real. This was at a time when people felt like we were losing our culture as a result of the residential schools, but the explanations didn't help. The spirits were angry about this, saying that the bridge between the two worlds should never be opened unless absolutely necessary because you don't know who you're communicating with. It could be good spirits, but it could also be evil. It might be ancestors, but you just never know. Anyways, back to the smoking man. The elders told him that the shadow thing with yellow eyes that everyone was hearing and seeing was the spirit. It crossed over into our side because of a shaking tent ceremony. Someone on the res had been doing them without the consultation of the elders. At this point, two of the most drunk dudes at the party started saying disrespectful things about this shadow person trying to act all tough. Most of us were looking at each other like, why would you disrespect an evil spirit? That's exactly how you attract them to you. That's when I went back to console my drunk crying friend. As I was with her, I noticed that the rocking chair outside on the porch was rocking back and forth by itself. I quickly looked away, refusing to make direct eye contact, but I could still see it from the corner of my eye. We are raised in our culture to ignore certain events. Spirits feed on the energy that people put towards them. So if you freak out, get angry, yell at it, scream at it, start crying, or anything like that, it'll actually stick around. That's what it wants. It thrives on energy of any kind. Five minutes or so go by, and I'm still seeing the rocking chair move out of the corner of my eye. Suddenly, I hear a commotion. One of the other girls claims to have seen the spirit. We named it Kukai. It's a word, an Algonquin, translating to monster. She said she was listening to the boys talk about the spirit when she saw one of the boys staring very strange out into the balcony behind her. She turned around to see what he was looking at and through the window was the shadow spirit sitting on the rocking chair, literally three feet away from her, smiling. The boy who had been staring out there sprinted towards the balcony doors, slammed them open, and charged at the spirit. I went outside to check on this boy. He turned back to look at me and said, get everyone inside right now. The tone of his voice made me just listen. He got back inside and told everyone to clean up the place so that we could leave. We spent a while just cleaning. That's when we began to hear the knocking coming from all around the house. After a while, we were finally ready to leave. People ran out, pile into their cars, and began to take off. Me and the boy were walking towards his truck. He was actually my ride home. When suddenly, he began to rush me and push me into the truck. Then he jumped in and we just peeled out. I asked him why he did that, but he refused to talk about it. A few days later, I ended up hanging out with him again, and he told me his experience of that night. When the other boys were disrespecting the spirit, he said he saw it appear out of thin air, onto the rocking chair, out on the balcony. He made eye contact with it, and suddenly, couldn't look away. He and the spirit were staring each other down, and that's when one of the girls saw his expression. She turned around, saw the spirit, and screamed. He said his first instinct was to defend his friends, and that's why he ran outside. 
He said the feeling that he was getting from the kukai was almost like it was daring him to do something. But the second he got up, the thing stood up and ran into the woods, disappearing from the patio. When the boy went outside, he stood on the lawn and saw it standing at the tree line, looking right at him with a smile on its face. Later, as we walked back to the truck, he saw it again closer, and that's why he pushed me into his truck to leave. After he dropped us off at our houses, he and his friends realized that they never locked the door to the cabin, so they went back. But his friend was too scared to go in, even though it belonged to him, so the boy went in by himself. The second he opened the door, the thing was standing in the living room. The boy locked the door as fast as he could and hopped back in the truck. The two then peeled out of the driveway. The sightings continued for a few days after that. It was the talk of the rest. But then suddenly, everything just stopped. There was no more knocking, no more sightings. Everyone was curious about what happened to the spirit. What was it? And could it come back? Would it come back? Eventually, word came from up north where sightings of the same spirit were seen in a different community. And then some of the white people in the town just north of us started to report very similar strange events. And then other reservations near us were as well. The way the stories were coming in, it's like the spirit was traveling north. As of 2018, there's been no more sightings. No one on my res or anybody else has seen anything remotely similar to what was going on. So, what do you all think? Let me know. Several years ago, I was studying business at a public college and I hated my life. And this was in the early 2010s, by the way. I was depressed. I had no friends. I had nobody. And this was a party school, so you could easily make friends everywhere. I was even close to dropping some classes. I had no job, no prospects of any. All I really had to my name was mostly negative. And during this stage of my life, when I felt that things couldn't get any worse, and I felt that I was at the bottom of the barrel, rock bottom, I ended up losing my last close relative to a car accident. I decided at that point that I had about enough of this shit. I grabbed my gun, a couple of boxes of ammo, some winter clothes, camping supplies, and three days worth of food. My plan was to wander off into the St. Joseph National Forest to die. And no, I didn't take a camera with me because I felt that it would just go to waste. After all, I was there to die. It was mid-December. It was very snowy outside. I stopped at Walmart to buy another box of ammo and a few packs of Newport cigarettes. I went to the bathroom there and I saw this poster near the toilet. There was this cute girl that had recently gone missing and I stared at her picture for a while, almost burning it into my memory. I ended up leaving Walmart still thinking about this girl and the thoughts were of how I'll never have one of my own and how I'll never have a family and all that stuff. So I drove out to Idaho and I ended up arriving at my destination. I stepped out of the car into the cold. I still remember the feeling that it gave me the crunch of the snow underneath my cheap boots. I unpacked my stuff. I ditched the car and I left it unlocked. I started walking. I light up a cigarette and I eventually lose sight of my car. So I hiked for a couple of hours. And after a while, I started to realize that I was just going in circles. So I veered off the trail and I just started hiking through the woods. I was really drinking in the beauty of it all. It's such a haunting and desolated place in the winter time. I started running low on cigarettes and I started to get the feeling that I shouldn't be where I am. Just a little bit of fear, but I ignored it as I was out there to die anyhow. 
I then began to feel like I'm being followed. I hear branches break behind me every so often, but I assume it's just snowfall weighing down on the branches until they drop. That's what it could have been, but I still doubt it. I run out of cigarettes shortly before sundown, and I say, oh fuck, almost in a loud voice. And I almost felt guilty for breaking the silence. That sort of feeling that you get if you said like a bunch of cuss words in front of your grandma at church. So I set up this empty water bottle. I fire some rounds at it from 50 yards with the motion. And the echoes just rang. And I didn't bring any hearing protection. Because, you know, I was on a suicide trip. I pulled out a single round and I tucked it into my boot. And I'm thinking that I'm going to use this one for shooting myself later on. I took the backpack off to do the shooting, and when I went to grab it, I noticed movement in the trees, maybe just a hundred yards away, and I noticed it because it was big. Whatever it was, it was really fucking big. I never had good eyesight, that's why the navy wouldn't take me, so I figured in the moment that it was just a blurry elk. I was standing there staring at it, wondering if there are even any elk in this part of the world. I then started to get this funny feeling. Moving slowly, I went to chamber around in my gun. It got stuck for some reason, and I glanced to see what the problem was. And when I looked up, it was gone. It was almost like it was a ghost. Well, the worst it can do is kill me, right? I mean, that's what I'm here for. So I blow off the whole experience and I quickly forget about it while I'm making my camp. I'm trying to get a fire set up. And trying to find wood is extremely difficult. And it's being a real pain in the ass. So I get frustrated and I have my little hissy fit. And I throw a piece of wood at a fucking tree. After yelling at myself. And screaming, fuck Fuck you. At the trees. I calm down. And I start to make camp. I then stop to eat because I'm not going to die of starvation out here. And I'm eating my MRE. And I'm starting to think, wait a second. Why does this taste like blood? And then I realized that the air smells like blood. And I think what the hell is going on here? It's the winter. And then I remember, I read about this before. But I tell myself to relax. There's nothing. And then I hear a distorted, fuck you, coming from the trees. It sounded like somebody was talking through an AM radio. I leap to my feet with my gun in my hand. I'm spinning around and around scanning the trees for any sign of movement. I then hear a branch break at my 9 o'clock, so I spin around and hold my rifle still. There's a fine dusting of snow that starts to collect on my rifle. After about an hour, I finally relax and I go into my sleeping bag. And I don't have a tent. Not because I'm out here to kill myself, but because I actually forgot one. And at that point I think, wow, I really am an idiot. So I fold the sleeping bag over myself without sipping it and I sleep with my rifle in my hands ready to go. I fall asleep with almost my entire body stuffed into the sleeping bag, but something woke me up. It was that smell again. It's the same as before, but much stronger. I then noticed that my fire was out. I checked my watch and I realized I had slept maybe two hours or so. I then realized that there's a tree that shouldn't be there, right at the foot of my sleeping bag. It's not a tree. It starts to move a little. I swear, I can almost hear it take a breath. It's much taller than a person for sure. And thicker too. I was able to make out the arms. Long, with these weird claw looking things on the end of them. The arms were hanging loose by its sides. My heart starts to pound out of my chest. Until that's all I can hear. For a split second. I consider putting the barrel into my mouth and trying to end it all before whatever this is gets me. But the adrenaline takes over. I slept with my gun in my hands ready to go in case something like this did happen. I used the gun to flip the sleeping bag off of me. I aim at the figure and I fire around. And I'm blinded and become deaf because of the noise. I leap to my feet swinging the rifle in front of me like a club and screaming. I slowly regain my vision and I panic. I scan the tree lines. It's gone. Maybe it's hiding behind a tree. I then start to think, wow, I haven't felt a fear like this in my whole life. And then I get loud. 
I'll kill you. Fuck off. And then somebody replies, a distant but clear, hello, followed by a second later, hey, are you okay? I reply with, who the hell are you? What do you want? The message came back, my name is Jim, are you alright? I ended up talking with it some more, all the while nervously scanning the perimeter. Then, a couple of other voices chimed in from the same direction and I told them that I almost got attacked by a bear. They fire off an orange flare, and I realized that they were actually a lot closer to me than I thought they were. They were just down over a hill. I'm pretty sure I passed through the clearing that they set up shortly before I made camp. Hey man, can you come to us? What if I get ambushed? I say, fine, I'll come to you. I have a gun, but don't shoot me, okay? It seems like it took homie forever to show up. We played a game of Marco Polo until he got to me. He had a stainless steel 357 and a flashlight. He introduced himself as Jim. He was a nice guy. He asked me if I was injured, and he was also short. I don't know why, but I figured he would be tall. He led me back to his camp and spoke to me quietly on the way. We had bear troubles as well. And then he got even more quiet and said, but this ain't no fucking bear, you agree? And I replied, couldn't agree more. After walking a little bit, he then says, the others still think that we just ran into a bear in the woods and they're all pretty calm, so try not to scare them. We were having a party out here and half of them are shit faced. I simply nod and say, Roger, how many people do you have with you? And he says, there's six others. We arrived at the camp. There were coolers and a couple of tents scattered around a low fire. There were beer cans everywhere, trash everywhere, and a moment of humor to break all the tension. Some insanely drunk dude stumbles up to me, puts his hand on my shoulders, and says, Where's the bathroom, man? And I just think to myself that this is a shitty horror movie, and we're all gonna die, and no one's ever gonna find us. The only other gun besides mine and Jim's 357 is a 22, unless you count the flare gun as well. Jim and the kid with the 22, who ended up introducing himself as Travis, were trying to convince the other friends to stop drinking in case the bear comes back. Jim then introduces me to everybody. The drunk guy from earlier has stumbled into a tent, and he is passed out, as well as this other girl that's in a different tent as well. I shake hands and exchange names with everyone else. But something is off. I notice it right away. I'm looking around at everybody and I started to run some numbers in my head. There's seven people in total, two asleep in the tent. Why are there still six people out here? Jim then goes off to work on the fire and I go to say hello to the last person, some other girl. She just ignores this and stares at me. It's kind of dark but I swear that her face looks familiar. I then see something move from the corner of my eye. It's stainless steel. It's the barrel of Jim's gun. He's pointing it at the person that I'm trying to talk to. Slowly moving closer, her face hasn't changed. It's totally blank. I get the feeling that I know her, and that's when I realize that I do. Her face matches the one of the missing person poster at Walmart. Homie then starts to say something to the effect of who the fuck are you? And then she wheels around and just goes into a dead sprint into the tree line. In an instant. So fucking fast. People who saw it start yelling. Who the fuck was that? What the hell? And then the smell of blood comes back. I check my gun. It's loaded. We then form a perimeter around the campsite. Over time, we make these expeditions to go to the tree line panicking and gathering as much wood as we can to build a fire as big as we can. Everyone who isn't drunk is clutching something. The 22, the flare gun, machetes, a hatchet, even regular knives. Nobody says a word. We then hear branches breaking off in one direction and then more breaking in the same direction. And the smell starts to get stronger. And I'm starting to think, fuck, I wish I had my cigarettes right now. The girl with the flare gun sees something and fires a flare into the trees. Underneath my breath, 
I think, oh great, you wasted one. I then see the silhouette, 15 or so feet from where the flare was lighting everything up. I fire around at it, it hits a tree, and the thing just bolts away. People see it and hear it run to the trees, but it doesn't run from the campsite. We can hear where it just stays around. Branches break, and people see things move around for another hour or so. At some point, the kid with the 22 starts to fire off rounds at almost everything. He then gets screamed at for wasting ammo. This continues. Jim grabs him and shakes him and tells him to knock it off. And I realize now that they look so much alike because they're brothers. As the whole thing unfolds, I start to hear something loud behind me. I look around and fire a shot at the blur that's moving towards the camp. This thing then sprints right through the camp. It grabs the dude and tries to haul him off into the woods. The guy had a machete and started hacking at it and it let him go. He was curled in a ball screaming. We dragged him back to the fire and calmed him down. But the thing was big. I saw it run with a funny gait. But it was fast. Oversized feet. And it even had antlers. I swear it had some. Someone then says, Oh, oh fuck, fuck Jimmy, Jimmy are, are you okay? okay? This thing then starts to circle more. All of us, myself included, started panic shooting into the trees. We're all running low on ammo and it's only 3 a.m. The fire is burning low. Then, it starts talking to us, mocking us, saying stuff that we already said. A couple of people started crying. I started to fucking lose it myself. This thing charges again right at me. I scream at it. My rifle had a bayonet and I buried it into its body and pulled the trigger. It tries to swipe at me with a claw and it just goes over my head. It then pulls back and darts back into the tree line. I chased after it, gun raced over my head screaming. I get into the trees and saw it crouching there six feet from me. It was dark, but I saw it. I looked into its eyes and just lost it. Every bit of courage left me. I stood there stiff, waiting for it to just kill me. I felt like hopeless prey. A couple of people grabbed me by the shoulders and dragged me back to the fire. I know they didn't even see it, but it was right there. I only have three rounds left now. I used the snow to clean the black, steaming blood off my bayonet. The camp was still circled, but we seemed to have injured the thing, and it wasn't saying or peering at us anymore. It was just wheezing, this loud, terrible, awful wheezing sound with what sounded like a cough and a shriek as well. The sun finally came up. It was the most beautiful sunrise I had ever seen, I swear. Everybody packed up their stuff. We hiked about 10 or so tense minutes in a tight formation to a trail very close by. I had no idea that it was there. I followed the trail back to their pathfinder and they all jumped in, and I'm stuck, just standing there. I start to remember my mission, why it was that I came there. I looked down at my rifle. I still had three rounds. I remember the bullet in my shoe, four rounds left, and someone says, what the, what the fuck, fuck are, are you doing, doing standing, standing there? there? Get the, the fuck, fuck in the car. car. I stop and say, uh, sorry, I have unfinished business and I start to walk back down the trail, back into the woods. I feel a crunch of snow beneath my boots, the ray of sunlight shining down. Then, suddenly, I felt somebody hit me in my head and I blacked out. They ended up hauling ass out of there and they swear they saw something big step out from behind a tree and watched them take me and drive away. We all agree that we shouldn't go back there again. A lot of them didn't even want to talk about it for some reason. I never did actually go back for my car. It was a piece of shit anyways. So, yeah. That's the time that I was almost going to kill myself. But I guess somebody, or something out there, had other ideas. Life is a journey filled with peaks and valleys, highs and lows. Some struggles we wear them on public, or if you're like me, we sometimes hide them beneath our smiles. 
I know I've done that plenty of times through difficult seasons. And we all face pressure differently. I know that we all have battles that we're fighting. Demons that we might be wrestling with. But we don't got to face them alone. Sometimes all it takes is reaching out. Talking to those around us. This isn't part of the story. But to anyone who's out there listening. Who might be standing on the edge. Going through a difficult season. Maybe even thinking of a choice. That they think they can't come back from. I want you to know this. You're not alone. There is hope. Just reach out. Drop a comment. Send me an email. Call a family member. Call a friend. And maybe just say. I need you to listen. Say what you need to say. Get it off your chest. Sometimes all we need. Is a listening ear. Mental struggles. Anxiety. Depression. It's a real thing. Something that really helped me within the last two years. Of losing my father-in-law. And my own father as well. And two miscarriages. Is when somebody told me. Look at your hands. And when you're struggling. Just tell yourself. I can only control. What is in front of me today. I had my darkest season ever. Last year full of depression. And being anxious. And something that really helped me. Was simply. Talking with you all. Francisco and I have been married for only three years when this happened. We lived in Texas at that time, and we actually still do. We hadn't seen his parents who live in a small pueblo in Mexico since we got married. That's why we wanted to take advantage of spring break to visit them. My name is Viviana, and this happened 10 years ago. Our two older children who joined us at that time were just young kids. We rested in different cities along the way as we got closer. We still had a little bit more to go to reach the village, but we were all getting tired. And, well, if you have kids, then you know how this goes being in a car stuck with them for more than a few hours. We did end up stopping halfway, and when I woke up that morning, my husband received a call from his family. He didn't want to tell me what the conversation was about. But I saw his expression change from joy to concern. I brushed it off, but looking back, I should have known that something was going on, or something was going to happen. As we got closer, I noticed that my husband somehow was starting to get a bit nervous. I asked him if he was alright, because he didn't seem excited like he had been previously. He simply said that he was tired, and he was ready to get there as we were only about 30 minutes away. However, the situation changed when we saw that the road was blocked. He parked the car. He was deep in thought for a few moments and then suggested that we go back to a hotel until the road was clear. Now this was very strange. We were almost there. A few extra minutes wouldn't hurt nobody, but it was obvious that he didn't want to take a detour which was a dirt filled road that would take us more time to reach his village. Now, in some remote places in Mexico, or getting close to the ranchos, there are no street lights, making it impossible to see beyond the reach of the car headlights. If something happened to you, or if your car stopped, you would be stranded in these roads unless someone found you. I then looked at my husband and told him that it would be fine. The kids are asleep, and some few extra minutes won't be so bad. Plus, the sun still hasn't fully set, and we can possibly make it before nighttime. He then started the car and whispered, You know what? You're right. Que Dios nos ayude. God will help us. And we venture into the road. The road was lonely and surrounded by woods as well. After about 30 minutes or so, I noticed that he started speeding and going faster. I asked him if he could slow down, that it was important that we arrive safe. But I know why he was speeding. The sun was beginning to descend and it was getting dark. 
He was saying that we had to get to his parents' house soon before they come out. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with some of the stories from Mexico about brujos, naguales, duendes, la Santa Muerte, the Holy Death, and people who can shapeshift into animals, basically witchcraft. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. There is a lot of that going on down here. My husband was one of those superstitious type, and so he always talked about certain things about Mexico. Like, don't speak about these things. Don't go out at night, especially out here in the ranchos. He always had stories about stuff happening to him as a kid. About birds turning into witches and flying away. Noises being heard at night. And people cursing animals and livestock and even humans themselves. Another 30 minutes or so passed and I chose not to say anything no more as I saw my husband focused on the road. And then there's the loud noise that comes from the front of the bumper. I only remember seeing something crossing out of nowhere when it happened. It was so fast. I screamed and the children started crying. Francisco stopped the car and got out to see what we had hit. I still had the children hug when he returned and he quickly started the car. He had a horrified look on his face that I had never seen before. Whatever he saw scared him. I asked him what was happening and all he said was that it was an animal and we needed to get out of there quickly. A few minutes passed and that's when I began to hear loud shrieks in the darkness getting closer and closer to us. Then, I started to hear those screams alongside of us. It also sounded like something was running beside the car. I turned to look, and that's when I saw it. It was a huge animal, similar to a black bull, but its size was abnormal. It had horns, and it had large red eyes. It was looking at us as it was running beside us. I could see saliva coming from its mouth with every scream it let out. I know this wasn't a normal animal. It's distorted face and features. It looked almost like a demon. Our kids started screaming. I covered their eyes to try to protect them, but those sounds made all of us tremble in fear. Francisco began to shout some words towards it, and he told me to move away from the window. That's when this thing, or this demon, or whatever the fuck it was, started hitting the car with its body. I felt like my heart wanted to jump out of my chest with every hit. I think it was on the fourth or fifth blow when Francisco lost control of the car and we ended up on the side of the woods, stopping right next to a tree. The impact was so hard that all I remember is seeing my husband passed out on the steering wheel. That's when I felt blood starting to trickle down my forehead and still dazed. I managed to see towards the window and I saw those demonic red eyes staring at us through the window. It was doing this while fogging up the glass and it looked like it had a smirk on its face. That's the only thing I remember of that night. That's when I passed out and that's all I remember. Sometime later I woke up I was lying on the side of the vehicle and there were several people helping my husband and children. A woman approached me and she started cleaning the cut on my forehead. Then I recognized them as my in-laws and my brothers-in-law as well. The morning found us in a small medical room. Lucky for all of us, we were all fine, just a few bruises. But that night, back at my in-laws house, they revealed to us that this creature that had attacked us was a Nagual that was actually known in the town. What we hit with the car moments before the crash was a different Nagual and apparently it was the young son of the first one. Francisco then said that when he got out of the car, this Dean was lying on the ground and couldn't move. The Nagual that was trying to kill us was near the young one at the time of the crash and upon seeing him injured on the ground he followed us 
as revenge. The call my husband received that morning was from his relatives back home, and it was about the road being blocked, and to warn him that the detour road that we were going to take was full of brujos or witches. After spending the week with my husband's relatives, we returned back to Texas. It was the most terrifying experience we had to live through. Even though the last memory we had was disturbing, before leaving the town, I felt a chill run through my body again. At a distance, in front of us, I could see an old man walking alongside his young son, who had a broken leg. When they fixed their gaze on us, my blood froze, as I remembered the same feeling I had that night, when that demon, Brujo, Nagual, or whatever the fuck it was, looked at me with those unforgettable, sinister, red eyes. So if you ever go down to Mexico, my advice to you would be for you to stay in the city, take only the main roads, and if you're going to visit family or friends in a rancho, in a village, don't go through any back roads. You never know who or what you might come across. For years, I was the guy you would call if you had a squirrel in your attic. I mean, to a lot of people, I'm still that guy. But over the last 20 years, I have branched out to other less common infestations. Now, I'm the guy you call if there is a haunted doll going through your attic or a Sasquatch trampling your flower beds. I actually love my job. All the skills I have acquired have allowed me to travel across the country. I have met incredible people and I have experienced cryptids like few have ever done before. It doesn't hurt that the pay is great, but the stories are even better. I have one short story for you now. It's more of a public service announcement than anything else really. I have dealt with every sort of infestation from Sasquatches. You spray human urine around the area of siding and it will avoid the area. A demonic presence. You need to bring in a priest. Sometimes it can be tricked into inhabiting a lesser creature, like a frog. And jackalopes. It's just a bunny with some antlers. Put it in a cage and give the poor thing a carrot. But recently, there has been one cryptid that has been growing more and more invasive into human settlements. It's called the Hide Behind. Most commonly found in the forests of the North United States and Canada, the Hide Behind is one cryptid that cannot easily be dealt with. In fact, I'm not sure it's even possible for one of these to be bagged and tagged like we normally would with other creatures. To my knowledge, no hide behind has ever been killed, maimed, dazed, or even simply removed from a residence. Once it has made a claim to an area, whether it be a local forest, a cave, or even, in one specific bloody case, a bass pro shop, it will actually defend that area to the death. It was first documented by the Native Americans, then by the Lumberjacks in the PNW of America. The hide behind is one of the lesser known but cryptids on the continent, but without a doubt, one of the most dangerous. No one really knows what they actually look like, as the name suggests. As soon as they are seen, they quickly duck out of view to hide behind anything in the vicinity. Out in the wild, this would be trees and rocks. In your home, this could be a corner, a kitchen cabinet, a TV, or literally anything else they can manipulate their body to hide behind an object 
of any size. In the few accounts of the sightings we have on record, they have been described as everything from a large bear, lion hybrid, to a frail and elderly woman with long arms and rashes on her skin. Because of this wide discrepancy in their descriptions, they are believed to be shapeshifters that can change their shape based on what they believe will best get their potential victim to come closer and investigate the sighting. I don't know why the hide behinds are moving into suburbs. I guess destruction of their natural habitat, but it is becoming a real problem. That's why I'm going to share the story with you now, so you know what to do if one ever shows up in your home. I pulled up to Tim's house around 12 p.m. on a Tuesday. He had called in to tell us there was a demonic entity in his house. He wanted us to remove it ASAP. They always demand ASAP. Tim had nothing going on, but people are just so much more demanding now than they were 20 years ago. I took a quick look around the house and it was pretty apparent there wasn't any sort of demon in his residence. Not only was there no reaction to the holy water and Ouija board I had brought with me, but Tim also didn't have normal symptoms of a demon haunting him, bad dreams, sleep paralysis, or the witnessing of any telekinetic events. After further questioning, he described what he had seen in more detail. He said, First, I was sitting right there on the couch watching TV when I got the feeling I was being watched. I turned my attention to the screen door and for just a second, I saw a bear looking in through the screen, but it wasn't a bear, you see. A bear would have just kept on staring at me or keep poking at the door. But this thing just ducked out of view as quick as can be, like it was trying to sneak up on me and I had caught it in the act. But I just grabbed my gun, set it on my lap, and kept on watching the TV and eventually that feeling like I was being watched just kind of melted off. It was all peaches and cream until she showed up a few days later. This she that Tim was referring to was a new human form that the hide behind was taking. I assume it was because of the lack of a reaction to the bear form it had previously shown itself as. Like I said earlier, the hide behind wants you to look for it to come near. Like the angler fish, it dangles something in front of you, attempting to bring you closer. It's a lazy hunter. Tim then continued, I was out in the garage in my workshop, and that feeling came over me again, that being watched feeling. I turn around, and I'm looking out the garage door, but I don't see anything. But then out of nowhere, I see a lady's head and shoulder pop out from the corner of the garage. And the second that she sees me looking at her, she pops right back around the corner where she came from. Well, this time, I went looking around for her. So I had seen crazy people, and she looked crazy. And I didn't want her grabbing me. So I gave a wide berth around that corner, and there was no one there. I walked all around the house, and I didn't see anyone, not even footprints. Tell me that's not demonic. It wasn't demonic. It was a hide behind, and I told the man as such. I told him living out here on the edge of town made him an easy target for it. I told him that there really isn't any way to get rid of them or scare them off. I told him he could try to leave his house for a year, at minimum, and maybe, with luck, it will leave on its own, but the best bet would be for him to burn the place down and never come back. He didn't like that answer. My family lived in this house for three generations. I'm not leaving, and I sure as hell ain't burning nothing down. I'll tell you what though, I'm gonna keep my shotgun on me. And when I get that feeling again, I'm going to shoot it. 
It works for bears, and that's the meanest thing around these parts. I don't see why it wouldn't work for this. What you call it? Hide behind? You can't argue with anyone over the age of 65. People get set in their ways. Their beliefs calcify. So instead, I was honest with him. I told him two things. The first thing I told him was that eventually, he'll get that feeling that he was being watched. And he'll get his gun and he'll start looking around for the hide behind. Only he wouldn't find it. That's what happens in all these cases. Because at that point, it found the best hiding spot it can possibly get. The only place you won't be able to lay eyes on it. Directly behind you. And at that point, it's too late for you. The second thing I told him was that I'll be back in two days. And more than likely, he'll be dead. And then, that's when I left. Two days later, I pulled my van up to Tim's driveway to find the screen door open and blowing in the wind. I didn't even need to cross the threshold of his house to find him. He was everywhere. On the floor, the ceiling, the walls, the smell was unbelievable. I poured some gas on the front porch and then I used a match to light it. The house was an inferno within 30 seconds. I got in my van and started to pull out of the driveway and I took one last look at the house and then beyond out in the tree line where I saw for just a split second a young boy before he quickly pulled back and disappeared behind a thin little tree. I was hundreds of miles away by lunchtime. I say all of this to you if you ever think you might have a hide behind in your house or even in the area, leave. Burn the place down if you can so nobody can move into it. These things are like bears. If they know they can get food someplace, they are just going to keep coming back. And if you get the feeling that you're being watched and you can't figure out why, call your loved ones because it's standing directly behind you.